Good evening, everyone. Today is June 17, 2019. The 39th meeting of the 23rd Council will come to order. All councillors are present this evening. We are now um, going to have a moment of silence led by the Pledge of Allegiance by Councillor Davis. Thank you, Councillor Davis. Civic parking, um, Civic Plaza parking passes are provided for members of the public. You can obtain a parking pass from council staff at the sign-up table. The council will take a break at approximately 7 p.m. this evening, if needed. We want to, we want tonight's proceedings to be as civil and respectful as possible. Please do not make any personal attacks, and please no applause or other outbursts during the meeting. The meeting will go a lot smoother if we are respectful of one another. We are now on item three, proclamations and presentations. Councillor Borrego. Thank you, Madam President. The proclamation I am reading tonight is regarding Juneteenth. Um, and it begins as, whereas on June 19th, 1865, Union soldiers landed in Galveston, Texas, with news that the American Civil War had ended and the enslaved were now free, establishing the foundation of the Juneteenth holiday. And whereas Juneteenth is the oldest known celebration commemorating the ending of slavery in the United States, and whereas in 1977, Juneteenth, or the 19th of June, was recognized as America's second Independence Day by the Congress of the United States through the passage of Senate Joint Resolution 56, and House Joint Resolution 11, and whereas Mr. Joe Padrell was the first person to organize an Albuquerque citywide Juneteenth celebration in 1976, and whereas in 2006, State District 19 Representative Cheryl Williams Stapleton, then House Majority Whip, sponsored House Bill 228, recognizing Juneteenth as a holiday, and the 47th State Legislature passed the bill making New Mexico, the 19th state to recognize Juneteenth. And whereas the Albuquerque Juneteenth celebration was held on Saturday, June 15, 2019, from 1 to 6 at the Kirtland Park. And whereas human and civil rights for every individual raise all citizens' welfare by, by enabling involvement and interaction of people within a nation. And whereas the celebration of Juneteenth continually grows every passing year with new participation from the original descendants endowed with basic human rights to life, freedom, and the pursuit of happiness by the United States. Be it proclaimed that the council, the governing body of the city of Albuquerque, hereby recognizes June 19, 2019 as Juneteenth and honors New, Mexican, New Mexico's African American communities. And I believe that um, we have an individual here to receive this from the Juneteenth uh, committee. If not, um, the city is sponsoring Juneteenth and we would ask that they would receive it as well. Um, sure, thank you, um, Madam President and uh, Councillor Borrego and Councillors. Uh, while we wait for, for those folks to arrive, we'd just like to say on behalf of everyone, thank you for your support of this. We're really looking forward to the celebration on the 19th. Well, I'm co-sponsoring that with the county and the Black History Month organizing committee, and also um, showing Ava DuVernay's film, 13th, which is a really important film about the criminal justice system. So we'd encourage everyone to come on out, and we look forward to seeing you there. I'm thinking that maybe there was a delay with the individual that was trying to, going to receive this. So Sarita, would you like to receive this? Okay, um, 
the next proclamation will be presented by Councillor Winter, and I just want to say fantastic job. Yay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam President. It is my honor to um, um, present the proclamation recognizing Olympic Day, and we have Mark Riker, the National Senior Games Association Chief Executive Officer, and Andrew Walker, National Senior Games Association Director of Health and Wellness, to accept. And while they're coming down, I'd like to say the city's been working over two years, two and a half years, to bring the senior games to Albuquerque. They are here now, and it has been a fantastic event so far, and we're very fortunate to have it and very lucky, and I think we're doing an, the administration has done an absolute great job of organizing this with the help of the, the National Committee. So here's a proclamation. Whereas, for 100 years, the Olympic movement has built a more peaceful and better world by educating young people and seniors through amateur athletics, by bringing together athletes from many countries in friendly competition, and by forging new relationships bound by friendship, solidarity, and fair play. And whereas the United States Olympic Committee is dedicated to coordinating and developing amateur athletic activity in the United States to foster productive working relationships among sports-related organizations like the National Senior Games Association, and whereas the city of Albuquerque promotes and supports amateur athletic activities involving Olympic and Paralympic sport during the 2019 National Senior Games presented by Humana, and whereas the city of Albuquerque prom promotes and encourages physical fitness and public participation in amateur athletic activities year-round, and whereas the city of Albuquerque assists, or assists organizations and purses, persons concerned with sports and the development of athletic programs for able-bodied and disabled athletes, regardless of age, race, or gender, and whereas June 23rd is the anniversary of the founding of the modern Olympic movement, representing the date on which the Congress of Paris approved the proposal of Pierre de Coubertin to found the modern Olympics, be it proclaimed that the council, the governing body of the city of Albuquerque, hereby proclaims June 20th, 2019 as Olympic Day and urge all citizens to observe such anniversary with appropriate ceremonies and activities, including Olympic Day at the National Games on June 20th from 1 o'clock p.m. to 3 o'clock p.m. at the Villa Ernesto de Ramos Athletic Village in the Albuquerque Convention Center. Great, great. So, gentlemen, Gentlemen, go ahead, please say a few words. I tell you, from the council to the council and everybody in the city, really all the residents, you should be very, very pleased with what has gone here. And it will really sum it up. I want to read, it will take 30 seconds, but this is, this is a note that I actually received from one of our 14,000 athletes. And it, it said, uh, two old codgers walked in at noon on Father's Day with backpacks after the morning competing in the National Senior Games, one from Canada and one from Virginia. A mariachi group was entertaining the diners, local families mostly. The food was fabulous. The service was fantastic. We were treated and honored as guests as people applauded us as we came into the restaurant by the entire restaurant. It was showed how proud the city was of this local family operated restaurant. It seemed clear to us that everyone took pride in their job and their city of one Albuquerque. And oh, did I mention that a tear came to my eye when a family came up and paid our bill and said, Happy Father's Day. Mm. So we applaud the entire city of Albuquerque and the entire council. That really sums up what you have done for us over these last two, three years. It has been phenomenal. We're still lots to go. Matter of fact, tonight out in Civic Plaza, we have a free movie night, Field of Dreams. Wednesday night, we have our celebration of athletes at the pit, and then back to the Civic Plaza for our fia farewell fiesta free concert at 6 p.m. So there's a lot still to go on as a citizen of your community. Come out and enjoy. And on Thursday uh, at 1 o'clock, uh, from 1 to 3 p.m., in the Albuquerque Convention Center at, in the Brazos uh, East Meeting Room, I want you to join uh, U.S. Olympian, 1988 Seoul Olympian, uh, Trish Porter Top Miller, who lives here. Uh, and then we have a special guest from the 1960 and 64 Olympics, uh, Sir Peter Snell. He was knighted. Uh, he's from New Zealand. He's a triple gold medalist. 
So we're going to, uh, he's going to share his story, and Trish is going to share their Olympic stories. And then we're going to have a special challenge between some youth and some senior Olympians. It's going to be an intergenerational fitness challenge. And so we're going to see, we're, going to re we're challenging this notion of ageism and, and that seniors uh, and their ability to perform uh, in the minds of youth. And so we, we kind of set them up uh, with, the, with, with the challenge that at best, it's going to be, or at worst, it's going to be a draw, but at best, it's going to be a win for the seniors. Okay? <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. One second, Councillor Winter. Thank you all very much. Come on up. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, Madam President. I just wanted to show this to everybody. This is the, the poster for the National Senior Games, Albuquerque, New Mexico. It's absolutely just beautiful. So if we can just see that, it's just. I will want to make one other note. That is a local artist. One of your local. local artists actually has that poster. So. Great. Keeping it here now. Great. Thank you. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. It's Councilor that Jones. Thank you, Madam President. I also want to note, even though those people on the poster look from the behind view like they're about 20, you'll notice that they are portrayed with gray hair. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Councillor Jones. And again, oh, Councillor Winter, I mean, Councillor Sanchez. Uh, thank you, Madam President. I just want to say uh, thank you to Councillor Winter, uh, who lit the torch uh, the other night, and the mayor for allowing that to happen. And I also want to thank Anna Sanchez and her team for the remarkable work they are doing. But I also want to say, give a special thanks to uh, uh, Mrs. Brasher, who was the director a few years back, and really worked extremely hard to get the games to Albuquerque. But I have been thoroughly impressed. I, they inspired me, because I was at, out at one of the events uh, yesterday and at the track and field at UNM, and these athletes are pretty inspirational, and they can run, and they can jump. <laughs> But it was amazing to see the athleticism of many of these athletes. Some were in their mid-80s. And I think tomorrow we have a big race with the, the Hurricane. She's a female that is 103 years old. We'll be running against a 100-year-old for the 100 meters. So I will be there to watch that event. <laughs> Talk about inspiring. I can't miss that for the world. <laughs> Councillor Jones. And the 100-year-old is from here in Albuquerque. And he has been running his entire life. Uh, and he's, he's amazing. So thank you. That, that's awesome. That's incredible. And I just really want to give a round of applause to Councillor Winter. I mean, he's really been persistent in this over the years, you know, and just watching and hearing the expected attendance. You know, Anna, where are you? You know, I know you reported that the expected attendance was going to be like 20,000 people. It turned out that there's probably over 30,000 people here in Albuquerque celebrating this. It's just wonderful. And we were watching the news the other day and, and watching uh, Councillor Winter carry the torch and saying, I can't believe this Bato, <laughs> pole vaults, you know, that's pretty incredible. That's an inspiration. <laughs> and I can't even get up. My legs are hurting. My arms are hurting. <laughs> so anyway, congratulations, Anna. So um, with that, uh, Councillor <laughs> Councilor Gibson and Davis. Thank you, Madam President. And let's just add the great work that all of our city staff has been doing. This is not just a senior affairs project anymore. Every department is chipping in in some way, form, or fashion. Uh, and we really appreciate that. Uh, as we're getting ready, I want to invite down our next, uh, some special people down, including some representatives from Equality New Mexico and Albuquerque Pride. Uh, Councilor uh, Gibson and I have a proclamation uh, that begins like this. Whereas the city of Albuquerque supports the rights of every person to experience equality and freedom from discrimination and that all people, regardless of age, gender identity, race, color, religion, marital status, national origin, sexual orientation, or physical challenge, have the right to be treated on the basis of their fundamental value as human beings. 
And whereas the city of Albuquerque has diverse lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, intersex, queer and questioning community who contributes to the enrichment of our city, and whereas the city of Albuquerque is committed to supporting visibility, dignity, and equity and for all people in our community, including, uh, sorry, including you FY20 budget uh, items, including the Transgender Resource Center and the Common Bonds U21 project supporting LGBTIQ queen, uh, teens, and as an employer, the city uh, medical benefits also cover gender reassignment for transgender individuals. And whereas this marks the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall riots, the birth of pride celebrations as we know them across the country, we honor the fight that our community in New, Me New York City mounted to protest the hostility and discrimination they faced from police. And whereas the Stonewall Inn was a refuge for queer people of color, homeless young people, people, and drag queens. This community united to demand acceptance and respect at a great personal risk to themselves. And whereas the Stonewall protest inspired pride celebrations across the world and sparked the LGBTIQ rights movement in America time and time again, this community has worked tirelessly for respect and, and equality. Their battles have been fought in the courts from marriage equality to demanding equal protection under the law. And whereas June has become a symbolic month in which the LGBTIQ community and their supporters around the country come together in celebration and in recognition of pride. And whereas we celebrate June as Pride Month in Albuquerque, we are reminded of what makes Albuquerque great, a remarkable capacity to live together and advance together across every conceivable difference. This June, we stand with the LGBTIQ community of Albuquerque as they declare pride in who they are and who they love. Be it proclaimed that the council, the governing body, the city of Albuquerque hereby proclaims the month of June as Pride Month and recognizes the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall Uprising. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you for being here and thank you for all of your work. Uh, was, of course, I was one of thousands uh, out uh, Saturday before last uh, at the parade and um, everybody was having a good time. I think our parades and the celebrations subsequent uh, over at the expo just seem to get better every year. So thank you for doing all of that. Thank you, Council President and uh, Councilors Gibson and, and Davis. Um, just real quick, I, I, I wanted to start with a very brief moment of silence for all of the friends and family that we have lost both here in New, Me New Mexico and worldwide to, um, to violence and, and to hate and bigotry. Um, there would not be a Pride Month without those who came before us, the fierce trans women of color who um, have remained on the front lines of the fight for all of our lives, many of them losing their lives to that fight. So thank you for that brief moment. Um, I, I want to give uh, Albuquerque Pride a moment to speak also, but Equality New Mexico is so proud to, uh, proud to accept this proclamation. We're headquartered here in Albuquerque, um, the state's largest city. Um, and one of those reasons is because we always, this is one of the most inclusive cities in the state. Um, we always score really well on the Municipal Equality Index. Um, and thanks to our work with the Keller administration, um, Councilors Davis and Councilor Gibson, and many of the other allies on the council, um, our score this year is going to increase um, quite a bit um, because of some of the efforts that we've been working on. Um, we're looking forward to continuing to working with all of you to update um, uh, non-discrimination uh, in contracting for city contractors, uh, to see an LGBTQ liaison in the mayor's office and in Albuquerque uh, in the police department. Um, but thank you to the, the council, to the community, to Albuquerque Pride, the Transgender Resource Center. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't um, mention the story time event that happened this weekend, the library staff. Um, Y'all really owe them a, a wealth of thanks. They uh, put in their heart and souls into that event to make sure that uh, programming at the, the public library is inclusive, um, that people can see themselves reflected in that programming, 
and the community turned out and responded to that. Over 250 people showed up. Um, it's, that's a, an important, uh, important milestone for the community to, to see that they want this type of programming. And so thank you. Thank you to the library for making that happen. Thank you, Adrian. Any Q&M? Um, I do want to thank you guys for everything for June. You guys, with just this simple proclamation, have made that everyone in the community feel that they belong and are included. And it goes more than just a proclamation or even the great partnerships we have um, with you guys throughout the entire year. But even just seeing the presence of having some of you at some of the events, the community sees it, the community appreciates it, and knows that we will march together all through for full equality throughout the year. So thank you guys. Councillor Borrego. Yeah, uh, thank you, Madam President. Um, I'd like to acknowledge one of my fellow councillors tonight, uh, Councillor Davis, who has really stood up for his own beliefs and the beliefs of others. And he has endured many hours, probably, of uh, difficulty in uh, standing up for his beliefs. And I, I totally respect you for the things that you have done for the community and you have really been an inspiration to me and I would like to tell you that um, you know you've stood up for equality for all regardless of people's race religion gender sexual orientation etc and I think that Albuquerque is really um, moving forward and being a model for acceptance of diversity in um, in our country, and I, I, I really admire you for that, Councillor. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Madam President and Councillor Rigger, thank you. I just want to thank you. I would expect you to say that. So uh, let me say thank you, and but acknowledge that there's just a handful of us like us that have sort of an extra opportunity to have an extra voice um, and an elevated voice, but. Um, whether it was sort of with uh, the mayor and our city and the community responding to folks who wanted to sort of erase our new symbol um, for our crosswalks or who wanted to protest some of the LGBT family events that we wanted to promote at the library. Um, it was really everybody in the community who stood behind us, who helped us and pushed us to do that. Um, and it wasn't that long ago that we wouldn't have been able to do that. It was 30, look at it, Craig, really quickly. Um, what, 40 years ago now, plus or minus? Thank you. Um, you know, 30 folks had our very first Pride celebration in Morningside Park, um, and this year there were 30,000 that turned out on Central. Um, it says an awful lot about our city, and it says a lot that uh, our city has two openly LGBT uh, elected officials, which is a caucus larger than some states still in our country. So I think we <laughs> are still setting that standard pretty fast. So thank you very much. I appreciate that. It takes a strong backbone to stand up for what you believe in, Councillor. Thank you. Thank you. So next we'll have a presentation regarding short-term rentals um, by Petra Morris and Jackie Fishman. Good evening, Madam President and Councillors. This evening it is my pleasure to present to you the short-term rental task force report. With me this evening is Jackie Fishman of Consensus Planning, who served as our consultant for the task force and the report. Ms. Fishman, Ms. Fishman will be going through the task force recommendations and process for us. And uh, in the audience this evening, we also have some of the task force members. And we would like to extend a big thank you to the task force members who put a lot of time and effort into this task force, as well as the public in general who have taken their time to share their thoughts, ideas, and concerns on this matter. City Councilor Diane Gibson and the City Council established the task force via Resolution 1849. The task force is comprised of a mix of city officials from relevant city departments, community members, and representatives from the relevant industries. 
The task force was tasked with considering the options for permitting, regulation and administration of any permit system and or regulations for short-term rentals. This report will be a resource for the councillors as they consider the development of any legislation on short-term rentals in the future. And while there is no legislation developed at present, it is anticipated that the development of legislation will be a next step in the process. And with this, I hand over to Ms. Fishman to talk more about the task force and the report itself. Thank you, Petra, and uh, thank you, Madam President and, and Councilors. Uh, my name is Jackie Fishman, and as Petra said, I was a consultant on this task force. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to come before you to talk about our findings and recommendations. Uh, before I get into the recommendations, um, if I could just recognize the members of the task force. Uh, the first one, I'll probably mess up her name, Celia Agli Aglia Laura from City Treasury, uh, Tanya Armenta from Visit Albuquerque, Nick Bullock from City Legal, Russell Brito, Brennan Williams and Jacobo uh, Martinez from the Planning Department, uh, Ken Cravens from Greater Albuquerque Association of Realtors, Jesse Heron from the Lodging Industry and the Tax Advisory Board, John Lucero uh, from, he's a real estate representative, Terry Quinn and George March are both neighborhood representatives, Tanya Mullen, who is a STR representative, Isaac Padilla from the mayor's office, Tushar Patel, uh, who's also a lodging industry representative and also on the tax advisory board, and of course, Petra Morris. My role on the task force was to provide technical research and analysis, facilitate the task force meetings, and assist the task force in coming up with recommendations regarding permitting, regulations and administration of a STR program for the city of Albuquerque. The task force meeting started on November 20th. We had a, a total of nine meetings um, and we also had a public meeting on March 19th. Consensus planning completed an analysis of best practices related again to permitting regulations and administration of STRs. We looked at eight different cities uh, including Austin, Boulder, Colorado Springs, Denver, Kansas City, San Antonio, Santa Fe, and Taos. Uh, we looked at all their or ordinances, compared and contrasted all of them. Uh, they all have uh, STR ordinances addressing applications and permitting. Uh, there are many similarities and differences between these eight cities, uh, but the, the best practice research helped us organize the uh, discussions with the task force. Our research section of the report starts on, on page seven. I'm assuming you have a, a copy of the report. Um, if not, well, I'll keep going. Um, the task force discussed the various aspects of STRs and worked on a series of recommendations which are contained in the report starting on page three. Uh, we came up with seven recommendations regarding permitting, uh, some examples of that include uh, SDRs providing emergency contact numbers, uh, the planning department being the uh, uh, administrator of the permitting process, how long the permits should, should run, an agreement that the STR owner agrees to comply with various city uh, ordinances like noise and trash and, and those kinds of ordinances, and then also providing a voluntary good neighbor agreement. Our next set of, of 11 recommendations are in regard to regulations of, of STRs. Examples of these recommendations include uh, STRs should be allowed in all residential and mixed use zones, but not in commercial zones. There should be no limit on the number of times a STR unit could be rented and that owner occupancy shouldn't be required. We also recommend that small private gatherings should be allowed but not special events since they already aren't allowed in residential zones by the IDO. Um, we also include recommendations on displaying the permit, including the permit number and marketing materials, and then assessing civil penalties for violations. Our next set of nine recommendations are in regard to the administration of an STR program. 
Uh, some examples of this include uh, completing a fiscal impact study, really the, the first order of business, uh, where the permit fees should, should go once they're collected, allowing for a STR uh, representative on the tax advisory board, filing with the city treasury or booking platform to, to pay lodgers and hospitality taxes beginning on January uh, uh, of 2020 per Senate Bill 106. Lastly, uh, this, the task force did have a couple unresolved issues as are explained in the report. These include the concentration and spacing of STR units in residential neighborhoods and occupancy standards. We looked at how this might work using a percentage of the number of lots within a block as opposed to separation requirements between STR units uh, like we have for other types of units or uses in the IDO. Uh, my staff prepared several diagrams on this issue starting on page 11 uh, that looked at using uh, potentially 15% of the lots within a block or 30%, but again, we didn't come to an agreement on that issue. Uh, the se second uh, unresolved issue was in regard to occupancy. How many people should be allowed to stay in a, a short-term rental unit? Uh, we looked at the Uniform Housing Code as a starting point, uh, which determines occupancy based on a ratio of habitable floor area and requires 150 square feet of habitable floor area for, area for the first occupant, uh, 100 feet, square feet for every additional occupant. This analysis starts on page 13. Uh, several of the cities simply say that just two people, presumably adults, are allowed in each bedroom. Uh, again, uh, we couldn't come to an agreement on that, but um, that was acceptable to the entire task force. And with that, I would stand for any questions. Are there any questions? Councilor Jones. Um, Jackie, just a couple of questions, and, and uh, the short-term rentals to me are kind of like, and I'm probably being too simplistic, kind of like a small motel, yes. uh, but several homes. So the question is, did you consider in any way the specific licensing for these? Did you consider the health inspections and the health requirements? Did you require anything about ADA access? Uh, how do you treat them? Um, in compa comparison to small motels of four or five units or a bed and breakfast? Well, we, I, I would say we, we didn't get into the, the nitty-gritty details like that, but um, in terms of licensing, it, again, it would be permitted. Um, we thought it should be permitted uh, through the planning department. Um, I think whatever would be required for a typical home would be required uh, for the, the STR unit, but um, beyond that, we, we didn't get into that kind of detail. Councilor Jones. Thank you. So Jackie, that would be if it were new construction, but if this is older construction, there would be right. no permit necessary, so it would be a business license, right? Well, you would, you would ha I'm sorry, um, Madam President, uh, uh, Councilor Jones, uh, you, would all, you would have to have a business license um, and a permit to run the, the short-term rental. So, so there would be uh, two documents that you would, that we recommend that the city would require. Uh, one more. Sorry. Councilor Jones. Sorry, I've been wanting to find someone I could answer these, ask these questions of. So these um, rental units would have to pay, the owners would have to collect gross receipts tax. Yes. They would have to pay that to the city as with all, they would have to have a business permit. Yes and one would hope that they would be subject to occasional inspections as far as health and safety issues. Agreed, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Gibson. So I just want to say a few words, unless there are other questions that other councillors might have. Um, I just wanted to thank both of you uh, Ladies, um, Ms. Morris and Ms. Fishman for really doing a good job. This, this turned out, we had a, a public meeting that there was a, uh, a, a lot of emotion there and people were very protective of, of their businesses as they well should be and I, I would expect them to be. Um, but I, also I'd, I'd like to say a few words about that and, and this is what I started with at that public meeting. 
this is a part of our hospitality industry that's really, really important to the city of Albuquerque. Um, we have just this week 30,000 people here in the city. We could not accommodate them with just uh, hotels and motels. Uh, and besides that, they offer a different experience. I'm about to go on vacation myself. And usually when I go on vacation, I use a, um, you know, one of the platforms out there uh, to, uh, to, to book a room for myself and whoever I'm traveling with. And it worked, so far it's, I've had pretty good results. And uh, so we want to encourage that. We don't want to restrict anybody out of the business. Um, but we, we want, I think, what um, STR owners and operators want, we, which is to have visitors of Albuquerque, people who are coming in here, to have a good experience. You know, to stay in a, a, a safe accommodations and go home with good memories. Um, so, um, also, the task force, it was, it was very... Um, uh, very grateful to the, all the work that they put in. Nine meetings is a, a big commitment, and I certainly appreciate that. And also to members of the public, which I know that I'm kind of repeating this a little bit, but the, what I'm referring to are the people who uh, took the time out of their day to attend the public meeting, uh, the commenters who who spoken in person with us uh, or, or uh, made their comments electronically via email, there's a website also, maybe we should talk about where the website is if, if anybody would like to take a look at this report. And is, how do we find the website? Madam President, Councillor Gibson, um, if we, if, if someone wants to find the, the website, they can go onto the city of Albuquerque, cabq.gov website and pull up your District 7 project website and then it's under initiatives and projects. Um, if you are having a hard time with that, you can also just send me an email, which would be pmorris, so P-M-O-R-R-I-S at C-A-B-Q dot gov. Thank you. Thank you both very much. Um, thank, thank you. Thank you. Um, if I could add, yeah, add, add one thing. Yeah. Uh, Madam Chair, and, and I'm, I'm glad uh, Councillor Gibson brought this up. This is a, uh, I think short-term rentals are a very important part of our hospitality. Uh, industry in Albuquerque. Um, in, in the report, uh, we talk about a, a, a market analysis done by Visit uh, Albuquerque. It showed the supply of vacation rentals in December of 2018 at 1,225 units um, and gross revenue in December 2018 at $1.66 million. So um, it, it is a, a, a industry, it's a business. Uh, that's uh, welcomed by the city, but we are, again, we were tasked with trying to come up with some way to, to regulate uh, that in our neighborhoods. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. We are now on item four, economic development discussion. There is none. We'll move on to item five, administration question and answer period. Counselors, are there any questions for the administration? Seeing none, um, we'll move on to item six, the journal. Councilor Borrego. Move approval of the June 3rd journal. Second. There's a motion and a second for approval. All those in favor say yes. Yes. Opposed, no. Motion passes. Item seven, communications and introductions. Are there any changes to the letter of an introduction? I move that the rules be suspended for the purpose of pulling EC 414 out of a Finance and Government Operations Committee and placing it on tonight's agenda for final action. EC uh, 414 is Mayor's recommendation of award to Jacobs Engineering Group Incorporated for closed landfill char characterization and treatment options. Second. There's a motion and a second. All those in favor, we need two thirds of the council. Um, all those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed, no. Motion passes. Councilor Benton. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam President. I move the rules to be suspended for the purpose of pulling EC 416 out of the Finance and Government Operations Committee and placing it on tonight's agenda for final action. EC 416 is approving an agreement with Borellas Community Coalition to create a retail food business incubator program within the Borellas community. There's a motion and a second. 
Um, this also, all of these will require two thirds vote. All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed, no. Motion passes. I move that the rules be suspended for the purpose of placing EC424 on tonight's agenda for final action. EC424 is Three Sisters Kitchen to provide in to provide in-kind services for the use of commercial kitchen equipment worth $300,000 and $800 over three years equal to the rental value of the equipment. Second. There's a motion and a second. All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed, no. Motion passes. Next is I move that the rules be suspended for the purpose of placing R-170 on tonight's agenda for final action. R-170 is approving and authorizing the acceptance of grant funds from the Cities for Financial Empowerment Fund Incorporated and providing an appropriation to the legal department for fiscal years 2019 and 2020. Second. There's a motion and a second. All those in favor say yes. yes. Opposed, no. Motion passes. I move that the rules be suspended for the purpose of placing R-171 on tonight's agenda for final action. R-171 is approving an intergovernmental agreement between the City of Albuquerque and the County of Bernalillo. There's a motion and a second. All those in favor say yes. yes. Opposed, no. Motion passes. Councilor Benton. Thank you, Madam President. I move the rules be suspended for the purpose of placing O-69 on tonight's agenda for final action. 069 is approving a project involving MBC Universal Media, LLC, pursuant to the Local Economic Development Act and City or Ordinance Floor Substitute 0410. The city is implementing legislation for that act to support the rehabilitation and improvement of production studio facilities located in Albuquerque, authorizing the execution of a project participation agreement and other documents in connection with the project making certain determinations and findings related to the project, ratifying certain actions taken previously, and repealing all actions inconsistent with this ordinance. Second. There's a motion and a second. All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed, no. Motion passes. I move that the rules be suspended for the purpose of placing OC 29 on tonight's agenda for final action. OC 29 is a staff's recommendation to appoint Ms. Tara Armijo Pruitt to the Civilian Police Oversight Agency Board. Second. There's a motion and a second. All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed, no. Motion passes. I move that the rules be suspended for the purpose of placing OC30 on tonight's agenda for final action. OC30 is staff recommendation to appoint Mr. Eric Olivas to the Civilian Police Oversight Agency Board. There's a motion and a second. All those in favor say yes. Yes. Opposed, no. Motion passes. Councilor Borrego. I move that the rules be suspended for the purpose of introducing R-173 and referring it to the Finance and Government Operations Committee. R-173 is amending the City of Albuquerque's component capital implementation program to include a new roadway facilities project, Paseo del Norte widening universe to the western city limits. Okay. Sir, um, there's a motion and a second. All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed, no. Motion passes. Councilor Benton Winter. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I move the, rules, move the rules be suspended for the purpose of introducing O-70 and place it on the August 5th Council Agenda for Final Action. O-70 is amending Chapter 9, Article 4, Part 1, Section 8 of the Revised Ordinances of Albuquerque the police oversight ordinance regarding case review by subcommittees of the Board of the Civilian Oversight Agency. Second. There's a motion and a second. All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed, no. Motion passes. Councilor Borrego. I move the approval of the letter of introduction. Second. There's a motion and a second. All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed, no. Motion passes. We are now on item eight, reports of committee. Councilor Harris. Thank you, Madam President. Let me uh, shift to my uh, committee thing here. I'm getting stuck. Um, the Finance and Government Operations Committee met on Monday, June 10, 2019, and reports out the following items. In a matter of EC 348, that it be withdrawn by administration. In a matter of EC 374, 409, 410, and 411, that they be approved and be acted on at the meeting in which they are reported. In the matter of EC 377, 383, and OC 28, that receipt be noted. 
in the matter of 058, 59, 61, 62, R141, 145, 158, 159, 160, and 161 that they do pass and be acted on at the meeting at which they are reported. In the matter of R79, 152, 153, 155, and 156 that they do pass. In the matter of R163 that they do pass as amended and be acted on at the meeting at which it is reported. In a matter of R-164, 165, and 166, that they be without recommendation as amended and be acted on at the meeting in which they are reported. In a matter of O-67, that it be without recommendation and be acted on at the meeting at which is is reported. I make a recommendation to accept the committee report. Second. There's a motion and a second to accept the report. All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed, no. Motion passes. Councilor Benton. Thank you, Madam President. The Land Use Planning and Zoning Committee met on Wednesday, June 12, 2019, and reports out the following items. In the matter of 052, that it do pass as amendment. In the matter of 064 and 65, that they be without recommendation as, amendment, as amended. I make a motion to accept the committee reports. There's a motion and a second to accept the committee report. All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed, no. Yes. Motion passes. We are now on deferrals and withdrawals. Counselors, are there any deferrals or withdrawals at this time? Counselor Betton. Thank you. Uh, I move a deferral to August 5th on R162, adopting interim regulations for the North Fourth Corridor to implement development regulations until the IDO is updated with permanent regulations for the area. There's a motion and a second for a deferral until uh, August 5th. All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed, no. Motion passes. We are now on consent agenda. Are there any changes to the consent agenda? Hearing none, we have um, one person signed up to speak. That's Mr. Tad Naminsky. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Ted Nemeski. First, when I look at uh, the EC19424, I thought this 300,000, $300,800 comes from Economic de Development Department. Then, when I start reading and look at behind it, who signed it, Carol Pierce, Director of Family Community Services, including also Sarita Nair. Oh, well, very interesting. Yes, this is also Council Benton District. Do we, people know how this money is being spent for the restaurant equipment? No, I already checked it. They do have restaurant equipment. Anyway, when it comes to any money comes from family and community department, that's, I spoke to Serbo also when it comes to the contractors, millions of dollars. Once this money they receive, we can, we can do nothing about it. They can spend it the, 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 the way they want it. Well, that is, where is accountability? In this city government, what is oversight? I have to, 15,000 from the state, I have to show it the receipts. Here, not, this thing not existing. I'm, what I'm talking, that's a statement from Family and Community Services, one of the managers, department manager. That's all I got to say, thank you. Thank you, Councilor Borrego. Um, I move approval of the consent agenda. Second. There's a motion and a second for approval of the consent agenda. All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed, no. Motion passes. We are now going to go on to um, 01969. This is actually a leader project for NBC Universal. And before we proceed, is this you, Councilor Benton? Yes. Councilor Benton. Thank you, Madam President. Thanks for moving this up. I think a number of folks here to hear this. Um, so this is uh, 0 1969 
uh, that thing that I just read that was really long. And this, this, has, <laughs> this has to do with uh, uh, using LIDA funds, local LIDA funds, to get to two to three million dollars uh, as our uh, down payment for uh, this major investment in Albuquerque. So I'll move uh, approval of 069. Second. Um, so this is, uh, again, NBC Universal Media uh, uh, using uh, the Local Economic Development Act and the city's implementing re uh, legislation to support rehabilitation and improvement of production studio facilities in Albuquerque. And uh, so there's a motion and a second for a due pass, and I guess we'll hear from staff or whoever's going to present on behalf of the, the city and the developer. Thank you. Thank you, Council President and Councilors. First, of course, we would like to express our appreciation to NBC Universal for their multi-million dollar investment in our community, especially Brian O'Leary, Senior Vice President, State and Local Tax, and Catherine McClure, Senior Director for NBC Universal. Both of them have joined us this evening. Our Economic Development Department would like to extend our gratitude to the governor and the mayor for their leadership, to the state legislature for their support of film incentives, and our chief administrative officer, Sarita Nair. Special thanks to Economic Development Cabinet Secretary Alicia Keys, who is also with us this evening, and Economic Development Division Director Mark Roper for all their hard work. Economic development is a team sport, as you all know, counselors. We also wish to express our sincere appreciation to our local partners in quality job creation. Albuquerque Economic Development Incorporated, especially Deb, Deborah Inman and Gary Tonjes, and we'd like to recognize Bieber's Dr. Jeff Mitchell and economist Julian Baca for their continued quality work on all of our projects. We appreciate the assistance of Council Services, Stephanie Yara and Crystal Ortega, and to the administration's legislative liaison, Isaac Padilla. And a big thank you to Chris Muirhead of the Modral Law Firm and our very own City Legal Department and Economic Development Department, Deirdre Firth. I have to tell you, she is a subject matter expert when it comes to all economic development incentives, and I wouldn't want to be on this journey with anybody else. A big shout out to Deirdre. And of course, our film division staff, including film liaison, Amber Dodson. Finally, our thanks to the planning department, the municipal development agency, the members of the Albuquerque Development Commission for agreeing to a special hearing today, and our communications staff for pulling off a successful press conference along with the state of New Mexico on Friday. And we wish to express our deep appreciation to you, counselors, for your continued funding and support of LIDA projects that bring quality jobs and economic prosperity to the residents of our community. None of this is possible without you. On behalf of the administration, we would like to say thank you to council for moving quickly. NBC Universal, a household brand name that people recognize, has committed to investing in Albuquerque by establishing a production studio in Albuquerque. This addition builds on recent news of film and TV in Albuquerque and will fully establish film and TV as an economic industry and hub in Albuquerque. It will ensure a higher, steadier supply of productions from a world-class leader in the industry and will result in hundreds of high-paying economic-based jobs. The new Albuquerque hub will serve as a home to NBC Universal original series, and films will give them more options for filming new series and films. NBC Universal has already committed to filming USA Network series Briar Patch, with so many more to come. We believe this partnership is an economic imperative, meeting our department's and the administration's criteria for LIDA projects. Our cri criteria as follows. Leverage, this leverages our core assets, focuses on high growth specialties, supports a focused and high return on investment project, creates economic based jobs, and this is along the lines of implementing place based strategies. 
We are here because NBC Universal is requesting $3 million in City of Albuquerque Local Economic Development Act funds to reimburse eligible lease expenses in two facilities just north of downtown Albuquerque. The company is also requesting $7.7 .7 million in state local economic development funds, but of course that transaction is not under review here. It is important to note that city and state LIDA funding is governed by performance-driven payout parameters, which Deputy Director Firth will discuss in further detail. NBC Universal commits to a direct spend in New Mexico of a total of 500 million in film productions over the next 10 years. NBC Universal and the facility owners, Garcia Realty Investments, will provide $4 million in capital improvements to completely renovate an older industrial building at 1601 Commercial Northeast and 1901 Broadway Boulevard Northeast and to maintain and operate the facilities for at least 10 years. NBC Universal is com committed to workforce development in New Mexico. NBC Universal will provide at least $55,000 annually for 10 years to fund workforce development programs, which will be run through educational institutions currently existing in the state. NBC Universal will provide trained experts to assist in the development of the training programs. They will also provide a stipend for training of two aspiring directors from New Mexico through NBC's Director Mentorship Program. NBC Universal has committed to marketing New Mexico and Albuquerque. NBC Universal will include an end screen credit with a state and city logo as appropriate in all film productions. Further, NBC Universal has committed to 500 million in support for direct marketing campaigns for New Mexico and Albuquerque. NBC's partner in the development of the studios Garcia Realty and Investment is part of the Garcia Families Business Group, headquartered in Albuquerque, New Mexico. The Garcia's family businesses are consistently ranked in the top 10 privately owned companies in the state. They are extremely well respected, have a deep commitment to the growth and economic vitality of Albuquerque, and have served on the boards of numerous community, civic, business, and char charitable organizations. With this co-development, NBC Universal and the Garcias are continuing to invest in the cutting edge of innovative industry growth in the community and will be providing high quality jobs in Albuquerque. And I'd like to say a little about the Garcias. Instead of waiting for opportunities to be offered, the Garcias have operated on the principle that opportunities must be made for oneself. And I happen to know this principle is rooted in love for family and community. Many years ago, I had the privilege of meeting the beacon of the family. She's here tonight, Sheila Garcia. She's behind me somewhere. Um, I'd like to say that Sheila, and many of you know her, she is the architect of this family we call the Garcias. It's not possible at all to sum up the actual strength of this woman within a few words. However, the real fact is that she and this family is the epitome of inspiration, strength, philanthropy, ambition, and entrepreneurship. So I'd like to say thank you, Sheila, Sheila. Thank you for raising men whose work ethic, philanthropy, and belief in an extraordinary Albuquerque is incomparable. In 2003, a year after the state film tax incentive was put in place, New Mexico had a direct spend from the entertainment industry of $7 million. By 2017, this figure had grown over $505 million. In 2004, the city of Albuquerque recognized the economic potential of the industry and what it could bring to our community with these new film incentives. And the Albuquerque Film Office was established within the city of Albuquerque Economic Development Department. The goal was to make Albuquerque the most film-friendly city in North America and attract major film and TV productions as well as smaller independent films. The Film Office has received numerous national awards for its high quality professionalism, responsiveness, community support, and ability to process film permitting in record time. This has led to the development of both direct and indirect industry businesses and jobs, something Albuquerque has a well-established base for. 
The majority of these crew members are technical trade workers who hold positions in set electric grip and construction fields and typically earn high average wages than that of similar occupations in other industries. For example, like carpenters who will earn $25 an hour instead of $18 an hour, painters who will earn $28 an hour instead of $16 an hour, tailors and dressmakers who will earn $25 instead of $11 an hour. The project budget will go towards local vendor services like lumber, glass, paint, and other materials needed to build sets. Local ca catering, dry cleaning, hotel retailers, and even security companies will also see benefits from the increased production due to this new production studio. Additionally, production companies pay local office workers and home owners location rental fees and often lease warehouses, parking lots, and city facilities. The overall economic impact is far and wide throughout the community. The majority of that spend will occur in the greater Albuquerque area, even if the project is on location outside of the production studio. Albuquerque will likely be a critical location for company production for many years to come, bringing a critical anchor of the most exciting, emerging, dynamic, and motion picture production to the city while providing employment for both new and experienced workforce as crew members will have steady high wage work close to their families. We are grateful for the support of the council and we look forward to our partnership with NBC Universal as they make Albuquerque their home. At this time, I would like to invite Deputy Director Deirdre Firth to discuss NBC's universal commitment to Albuquerque and the project participation agreement. Thank you, counselors. Uh, good evening, counselors, and uh, thank you, Deirdre Firth, Deputy Director for the department. Um, my director did a great job of summing up the key elements of this project. Um, and uh, in addition to echo Cynthia's thank yous, I would like to express my sincere appreciation to Cynthia for the many hours she has put in on this project. It's important for staff to have the direct involvement from um, our directors, and I am blessed with mine. I'll hit on some of the legal points. Under the Local Economic Development Act, the state and local governments are empowered to um, offer discretionary incentives. Um, uh, qualifying entities for these incentives include a business in which all are part of the activities involve the supplying of products and services to the general public, government agencies, a specific industry or customer, and as such, the NBCU project represents a qualifying entity under state and city laws. It's important to note that the evaluation criteria normally addressed in a leader project around job creation has to be addressed differently due to the nature of the film industry, and we focus on the evaluation and performance requirements structured around direct and indirect spend. While we know this results in hundreds of jobs, the pe performance measures and penalties and clawbacks are built around their ability to meet these financial commitments. Uh, the project includes the fiscal impact analysis prepared by the university's Bureau of Business and Economic Research and shows that project will generate more than 2.125 million in net new tax revenues above the city's investment. In terms of land use planning and zoning, there is no zoning change required for this facility. Um, the existing, in, existing zoning under the IDO allows for light manufacturing mixed use industrial which includes motion picture and television filming. The surrounding area consists of older industrial warehouse distribution and commercial facilities, and this proposed development um, is going to really improve that area um, by its investment 
in a federal opportunity zone, the Met Martinez Town, Santa Barbara metropolitan area, redevelopment area. And the project is anticipated to have a neutral environmental impact. There is ample um, available parking on site on nearby on street parking and the availability of nearby facilities owned by the Garcias. Broadway is considered a regional principal arterial roadway and traffic is anticipated to be able to be accommodated um, on this facility. The project will support an economic development strategy for Albuquerque Bernalillo County to attract development and retain responsible and responsive businesses, nourish the expansion of existing and new local businesses, and e emphasize economic based companies. It encourages the expansion of export based businesses to customers across the country and encourages prospective employers willing to hire local res residents and diversify the employment base. Uh, let's see here. I'm going to try and cut through some more stuff here. With a production, with a projected production spend of 500 million in New Mexico, company estimates it could create up to approximately 333 annual full-time equivalent positions. Given the nature of the film industry, number of people directly and indirectly employed will be much more significant with a total direct, indirect, and induced employment of over 600 people on an average annual basis. In addition, there are 82 local construction workers um, employed on the project. Bieber's report estimates an average wage of over $58,000 multiplied by the 333 jobs equals more than 19 million in direct resident payroll and um, the annual average um, including wage inflation will be 21.25 million. They also anticipate that 70% well of their um, $21.5 million annual expenditures will be in Albuquerque. Uh, they will be making lease payments of $98,000 monthly. Uh, the city assistance will be $3 million um, in local economic development funds to assist with these lease costs. Uh, the state has providing additional funds for lease and tenant improvements. I'm going to read through all the rest. Um, the project participation agreement will detail um, all of these uh, project agreements that were mentioned above. They will contain the city's standard clawbacks and penalty requirements, as well as uh, reporting requirements. Uh, findings. Alita 19-1 is a qualifying entity as defined by the state's Local Economic Development Act and city enabling legislation. Alita 19-1 will make positive substantive contributions to the local economy and community by re renovating older industrial facilities, committing to 500 million in TV, film, and media productions including at least 420 million in direct spend and 80 million in direct, indirect spend, 65 million of that in the Albuquerque metropolitan area every two years. They will commit to operate for 10 years and further make per, further positive contributions by their commitment to um, annual marketing of more than, uh, let's see, $500,000 and the commitment for $55,000 a year for the workforce development programs and their director mentorship program. They will include a screed credit with appropriate state and city logos in all productions. Uh, finding number six, they've demonstrated the financial cap capability to undertake and manage the project. Finding seven, they will comply with adopted city plans and policies. Uh, finding number eight, 
They will adequately meet the evaluation criteria established by the city for these projects. Staff recommends approval. We stand for questions. We have representatives from NBC Universal in the um, audience, as well as from the Garcia family and the State Economic Development Department. We're pleased to bring you this project. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor um, Borrego, followed by Councilor Gibson. Oh, I thought Councilor Gibson. Thank you. I just wanted to, uh, where did Deidre go? Wherever you are, there you are. Just wanted to thank you for the presentation, both yourself and Director Jaramillo, and really to congratulate everyone involved, from the state level, uh, the, the Garcias, and uh, uh, everybody here in the city who worked so hard on this. And uh, this is really a, a, a big day for Albuquerque, a big week. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, Councillor Benton? If there are other counselors who have anything, please should go first. We have some public comment, so. Councilor Borrego. Um, just so I understand, and Deidre, you've been tremendous, and both Cynthia and Deidre, I've worked with Deidre for a long, long time, and mm -hmm. I know, and I trust her. Um, always, you know, when we do these kind of deals, there's questions about the clawbacks, and I'd like for somebody to kind of, I, I read it, and I tried to understand it, but I'd like somebody to kind of explain it to me a little bit more clearly. I'm happy to do that. Uh, first, um, we have the uh, facility closure clawbacks. Um, if the company closes their operation within the first five years of operation, they are required uh, to pay back 100% of the um, commitment or the financial investments by the city and state. Um, the next two years, they would be required to pay back 60% of the investment, and the years after that, 25% uh, of the investment by the city and the state. Um, in addition, uh, if they do not meet the production spending requirements by the city and the state, there is a uh, penalty equal to the percentage shortfall multiplied by the amount of money that the city and state have contributed. Oh, multiplied by the amount of money the city and state have contributed. So it's a relative amount um, based on a pro rata basis and how much time they have spent in the community. Uh, I think those are the major points. Is there anything else I can clarify That's one other for question you? I had, and that was with regard to the FTEs. Um, and what I see in the write-up that I have mm -hmm. is that um, there were 333 annual FTEs um, and then 134 indirect FTEs and 142 induced FTEs. Is that the total that's down here of 609? It doesn't add to 609, but there's also in the fiscal impact portion of it, and you, you may not have this, but... There's a discussion about 609, an average cost per job created of 609 FTEs will be 14,286. And then, so I was just trying to figure out if that's the total. Councilor um, Miss Yada seems like she has an answer. Um, yes, uh, Madam President, Councilor Borrego, I, I did the staff write up uh, oh. based on the information that uh, Deer just sent to us. So. Um, the 30, 333 annual FTEs plus the 134 indirect and 142 induced do add up to the 609. They do add up to yeah. the 609 And so I total. just divided that uh, into the total amount of LIDA funding that the state and the city were giving to come to the 14,000 per job. So that's an average, right? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Councillor Benton. 
Why don't we go ahead and hear from public comment. Okay. Um, before we do that, Ms. Um, Firth, and I don't know who can answer this question. I actually had a constituent come in up to me prior to the meeting to ask me. I guess there are some um, paintings on the walls for R.C. Gar Gorman paintings, and I, I guess there are murals outside, and they were one, they were saying that they were actually um, on the National uh, Registry, and we're hoping that they were going to be preserved. So if maybe you can get that question answered uh, while I uh, call up the next two speakers for public comment. Um, Madam Mr. Uh, Garcia President. seems like he, Mr. Garcia. Oh, okay. Here He's comes raising uh, Mr. His Ed hand, Garcia so. <laughs> who can comment more directly on his properties and what they're doing. President Pena, counselors, I think there might be some c confusion. We have a set of original garments hanging in the former bank space at First Plaza Galleria. That might be the confusion. There's no original art um, anywhere near there. There's some, uh, the mural art, so to speak. Uh, I don't know what you call the, the paintings on the back along the train tracks, but that was just done by uh, <laughs> people in the night. So I don't know. We do have a uh, okay. fabulous collection of garments, but they're well, not there. there. There's a gentleman here, um, right there with the um, silver coat on. He can actually, you can pull over and speak speak with him. Oh, I didn't necessarily, okay, Thank sure. You. Well, I'd just like to invite the, the granddaughter of Gorman to speak to them. Hi, uh, hi, my name's Colleen <laughs> Gorman. Sorry, this is, I think there was a little bit of um, mis or confusion on this. Um, because I I was uh, I read the ordinance um, and I thank you, had, Mr. Garcia. Yeah, and so I think there was some confusion about the purchase of the Skip Maisel um, jewelry store that or a trading post that's on Central. Oh, this isn't. I, yes, I know. Okay. So uh, I I was gonna okay. say that when I brought up public okay. comment because in front of that building. Um, the, there's uh, two murals and other murals. It was a 1939 project for the CCC. Okay. And that one, I just wanted to make sure once the trading post. Okay, so that was your public comment? Well, I, I heard that it ha was supposed to be approved by the city and I wasn't sure. I only had a little bit of information. So I think just the information got confused uh, in terms of the address. So when I read the address and the ordinance, I realized that it, it's not those particular buildings. It's Correct. actually the buildings over here. Okay. Um, so when I talk about public comment, I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that and other things. So um, it's it's a separate space, so I apologize okay, for so that. Okay, so the public comment on this one has to be germane to the the topic. Right, and okay. I, 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 I thought it was, but it's okay. not. Okay. So I apologize. Thank, Thank, Thank you very you. much. Mr. Garcia. President Pena, counselors, the, we do own the Maisel Trading Building at 510 Central, and uh, we plan to restore the murals, which aren't in uh, very good condition. But there's there's no RC garments painted there either. Okay. But it's, uh, there's some there's some publicable areas that are spectacular. <laughs> okay, thank you, thank you. So we'll go on to um, public comment. We have Nick. I just have a first name or perhaps last name. Oh, I know who that is. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Council President, Councilors, I am here on behalf of the Board and members of Semillas y Raices, a community group working on behalf of Santa Barbara and Martinez Town residents and businesses. This evening, I am here in support of O69 and to thank all those involved in the new and so very exciting NBC Universal Media Project located in our neighborhood. An old liquor warehouse has retired and its building is now transformed into the NBC Universal Media Sound Studio. Thanks to that project, our neighborhood has inherited a renovated building, some new construction, new landscaping, and sidewalks. Thank you so very much to everybody. This project would not have come to fruition without the vision, the commitment, the laser focus, and tireless work of all involved. It is my duty and my honor to thank our governor, Michelle Lujan Grisham, and her staff, our mayor, Tim Keller, and all in the city who participated in this grand effort, our city councilor, Isaac Benton, NBC Universal Media, and especially the Garcia family, Garcia Automotive Group, for their vision and unwavering commitment. 
for all those that I have missed, thanking, please forgive me, it is unintentional. We look forward to future efforts to revitalize our small and historical community. We strongly urge all to jointly work at protecting the character of our neighborhood, albeit a challenging effort. And finally, we look forward to dispersing some of this new wealth for the empowerment of our residents, community at large, and our commons. This neighborhood continues to look forward to joint commitments to revitalize not only its buildings, but also its people and local institutions. For the current and future members of our very unique community, we want both to renew and recreate our village within the city of Albuquerque. In that spirit, we urge this council to vote their approval of the NBC Universal Media Project tonight located on, on commercial in the Santa Barbara Martinez Town neighborhood, and I look forward to its opening this October. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Colleen Gorman, and I'm not sure whether she wants to speak anymore. Colleen Gorman. Um, I'm, I'm um, super excited, and I just want to say uh, today and end in time, just to add to this, is 10 movement in the year of seven read, and that's on the sacred calendar that ties all indigenous people together from um, tip of South America to North America. So um, this is a big day where things are moving and changing, and I just, um, I think you guys have done a very wonderful job with bringing in um, some potential jobs and just positive outlook for Albuquerque and it's super exciting. I was excited about the director's um, mentorship program when I read through the ordinance and other things in there. Um, just, you know, as a, <clears throat> just as a nonprofit public access operator and as a founder of the Media Arts Collaborative Charter School, um, I'm just very happy to see that um, this movement towards uh, supporting the film and television industry um, ties in so much to even just public education and teaching people how to share their own messages. So I just want to say thank you and, and this is a good blessing day and so that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So that concludes um, public comment. Councillor Benton. Thank you, uh, Madam President. Uh, said Secretary uh, Keys is in the audience. I wondered if she wanted to speak to us briefly. <coughs> and those of you who don't remember, she was our film liaison after Ann Larner, and now she's in the bigger leagues. But welcome. Thank you. And thanks for all you've done for this. Oh, which deal. one am I going to? Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Chairwoman, Chairwoman and members of the council. It's great to be back. Um, it's an exciting project, um, not only because it's a private-public partnership, but because it is bringing in $500 million of outside money into our city and our state. Um, this last legislative session, we put together um, SB2, which is legislation that creates film partners for the state of New Mexico. And these are companies that are committed to being here for 10 years. And NBC is now our, NBC Universal is now our second film partner. And not only with their production spend um, commitment, but also with the amount of money that they're putting towards workforce education and also helping to market the city and the state and towards the director's initiative, I think you can see that this truly is a partnership in every way, shape, and form. And we're getting better and better at doing these deals. And we can't be happier to have them here. Um, I'd love to take any questions if you have them. But we are fully supportive of the state at the state level, and we are committed to the $7.7 .7 million. This is a huge priority for Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham. And we really see it as an industry that not only creates jobs, but creates wealth. And that is the most important thing for us right now. Because we don't have a unemployment problem. We have a wealth problem. And by creating jobs in sectors that pay more than minimum wage, much more than minimum wage, then that's what we're doing for New Mexico is we are creating wealth. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for hearing this so quickly. And um, just thank you for all of your support through not only this deal, but the past deal. Thank you. 
Thank you, Secretary. You're doing an amazing job. Um, Councillor Sanchez. Uh, Secretary Keyes, I want to personally thank you also for your work. I know when you left Disney, it was a big loss for Disney, but it was a great gain for Albuquerque <laughs> and the state of New Mexico. And uh, the work that you have done in bringing the film industry to Albuquerque has been remarkable. I think this is miraculous that we now have NBC Universal, uh, we have Netflix, and I think it speaks uh, greatly for the uh, film industry here in our community and the people that work in that industry. You know, now big companies like NBC Universal and Netflix are located here, but that's because of the work of CNM and those individuals that have been in the film industry here in New Mexico for a long time. You know, they appreciate the work that's been, been done, they appreciate the education that's being put out there by uh, CNM, and we think remarkable things and magical things are, are gonna be coming to this city. Thank you very much. Uh, Madam Thank Chair, you, we do have um, IATC President uh, Liz Pecos here, if anyone would like to talk about anything about wages or with regards to career jobs. Sure, bring, yeah, sounds good. Good evening, Madam President and members of the Council. My name is Liz Pecos, and I am the president of IATSE Local 480. That is the Film Technicians Union here in New Mexico. We represent 1,400 members that work in film positions on set in pre-production, shooting the productions in post-production. Uh, there are also several other unions that are represented in our state of film workers. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions. I can give you a brief overview of the type of wages we do make and benefits, if that is of interest. Councillor Davis. Thank you, Madam President and, uh, and President Pecos. Thanks for being here. Uh, you mentioned that you represent 1,400 uh, union IATSE workers. Uh, there are a lot more uh, sort of that work spills out into the community in all kind of different ways and contractors and vendors. But as we hear talk about this and Netflix and other productions that are already in place, um, there's a need for a lot more film workers than you currently have in uh, 480 and 423. Can you tell us a little bit about sort of what are the, the growing jobs in the, in the union and sort of how much those pay and sort of what is the pipeline that you all are working on already to be sure we have enough folks to continue to staff these deals? Absolutely. Yes, Madam President and members of the council. Uh, so currently IATSE has 1,400 members. We have 600 that are on overflow that are in the process of getting their days and joining the union. Uh, we also have local 800 art directors that are working here in New Mexico, local 600 camera. We have transportation, local 492, uh, that has several hundred members and, and overflow members as well. SAG-AFTRA has close to 1,000 members that are working. Um, we also have DGA members that are here in New Mexico, and then there are thousands of, of local citizens that are part of the background artists that work on every production in New Mexico, and they can be employed in the thousands on each production. Um, we expect with these film partnerships, Netflix and NBC, Universal especially, to a double our membership within the next couple years, and that goes across the board. Um, and this job spreads out from the film workers into infrastructure, into security, into all kinds of industries and vendors as well. Um, the median salary for a film worker on the low end, especially for an NBC Universal production, is going to be the lowest you can make is a base salary of $26 an hour. Um, most employees are hired with a base salary of $29 to $32 an hour, and then many members are into the negotiating wages of $35 to $45 an hour and up. Um, these, these wages are set at a base rate. They, you get paid that for eight, hour, eight hours that you work a day. From eight to 12 hours, it goes to time and a half. Any time worked over that or six, six days, you get time and a half or double time. Uh, the benefits are incredible as well. Each employee is making up to $110 or more a day in benefits. That is health benefits, full health, um, health for your family, annuity, and pension. Um, so the quality of life for members that are working in the industry is quite great and well over what the median income of any other um, professional in New Mexico is making. Um, we have seasonal workers, and with deals like NBC Universal, we hope to create more full-time workers. Seasonal workers can work up to about 1,200 hours per year. Full-time workers, on average, work about 3,000 hours per year and upwards into 4,500 hours per year. 
Um, so we work very hard and uh, we're able to provide for our families and buy homes here. I will say Albuquerque is known as one of the production centers and most workers, even if they're working outside of the state or, or, or in different parts of the state, their families do live in this, in this area. Did that answer thank, all the questions? Thank you, Madam President. It did. It and if I can follow just to, thank you, Ms. Pecos, and follow what Secretary Key said earlier about creating wealth. Uh, I had the chance to meet some film workers at the Hall of Fame dinner in Santa Fe a few, maybe last year. Um, and I met two women who started as, uh, I'm sure they have a better title, but they were hairdressers for the movie industry, working part time, had gotten their certifications through IATSE, um, still do that on call. Uh, but they had opened their own hair shops uh, in Albuquerque and in Santa Fe full-time, employing four other people, four other families full-time to do that work based on the work that they had started and the skills they learned through the film industry. Um, and so it, it is creating wealth for New Mexicans. It's money that outside dollars that are coming into New Mexico, um, employing our families, giving us skills and a trade that we're proud to pass on to a new generation of folks. And so I'm grateful for what you all do, and I think this is great, and I applaud uh, the administration and NMED for doing that. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Borrego. So the question I have is with regard to the average New Mexican, the ab average Albuquerquean, um, and I'm interested in finding a job and working with your unions and, you know, looking for this, maybe I have the skills, maybe I don't. How do I know where to look? How do I find the access that I need in order to get that job and to actually make you know, have that accessibility for my family. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Madam President and Councilwoman Barrego. Uh, yes, that's a great question, and I want to thank Secretary Keyes and uh, Governor Grisham, Lujan Grisham's administration and the New Mexico Film Office of working so collaboratively with us. We're also working with Workforce Solutions to, um, to find direct access lines for New Mexicans, especially um, students that are in the institutions right now for educating them about ways to get into the industry. Um, most of the locals, including our local, we have our membership process that's listed online and we attend all the fairs and uh, we are eager to allow people, um, that, to, to get people started in the process. Um, additionally, IATSE Local 480 is launching a training program that will include mentors and crafts and skills and safety training for members and for anybody who signs up on the overflow list. Uh, so we are interested in creating even higher paying jobs for New Mexicans that's in like the supervisory roles and higher up roles that used to be outsourced to um, people from Los Angeles or New York. Um, the studios have taken note of this and are hiring locally for those positions. So is there a website or something that for I would us, go For us, you want to go to local480.com. The Teamsters local is local492. And uh, mm -hmm. if, you, if you call our office, we can also assist you if you're interested in camera or art directors and, and let you know where to go for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Madam President and uh, Councilor Borrego, in addition, the city's film office is constantly speaking to local groups and community organizations and student groups about how to get involved in the film industry and there's information on the city's film office website. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Sanchez. I don't have any questions uh, specifically for you. I would just like to say welcome NBC Universal to Albuquerque. I think it's going to be a tremendous asset to our community. And I believe this afternoon the Albuquerque Development Commission voted unanimously uh, for this project. I want to thank uh, NBC Universal for your investment into our community, $500 million. Also the performance clawbacks and the facil facility closure clawbacks. Hopefully we won't have to be dealing with the facility closure clawbacks. And 10 years from now, we will be talking about the successes of NBC Universal and also uh, Netflix. But uh, this is going to be a tremendous asset to our community. And I'm very pleased with our staff and the work that they have done. Uh, Cynthia, Deidre, uh, you've done a great job. But this takes a community effort and a state effort. We alone could not do this without the support of the state of New Mexico. And I want to thank uh, Governor Lujan for her work. Uh, they are contributing $7.7 .7 uh, the city of Albuquerque's investment is $3 million. And also I want to personally thank uh, Sheila Garcia and the Garcia family for their investment in our community. 
uh, task us was previ previously voted on by this council. Uh, that's a big investment at the Galleria downtown, and they were involved in that, uh, that investment. I mean, so a lot of great things are happening in our community, and there are people that are from Albuquerque, like the Garcias, that are making huge investments in making sure that Albuquerque continues to prosper and to grow. But again, NBC Universal, I think you're gonna be a great asset and you're gonna be here for a long time in the city of Albuquerque. And I also wanna thank the sponsor, uh, Councillor Benton, for your work in working with uh, the staff and also with NBC Universal and the members of uh, NBC Universal. Thank you for being here this evening. And I'll say ditto and pass it over to Councillor Benton to close. Thank you. Well, I think I hope everyone has been thanked that has been working on this. I could go through that list again, but yeah, Governor, Mayor, uh, uh, NBC Universal, Garcia family, um, uh, our, our great folks at, at uh, Economic Development. And um, I, do, I did wanna put in a pitch and a thank you for something else, and that's our creative economy and our unique heritage that we celebrate in New Mexico. I really believe this is part of the reason uh, NBC Universal is, is here and that the industry is, is embracing Albuquerque the way it is, that our creative economy on a local level and our wonderful unique culture is, is really part of uh, what's helping us rise up uh, this way. Um, I did have a, I'm gonna make one brief comment about the uh, ADC meeting this afternoon. I spoke to uh, Terry Bruner, who is uh, one of the members, and I know that he brought up uh, questions and p possible concerns of the immediate community with regard to traffic. I just wanna say that uh, we're working with the Santa Barbara Martinez Town uh, Neighborhood Association already uh, using a participatory budgeting uh, procedure to identify their uh, uh, their priorities uh, for their own neighborhood and we have st uh, state capital outlay funds and matching city funds for uh, pedestrian and, and traffic safety improvements uh, for that neighborhood. So uh, this wasn't anticipated as part of that process, but uh, certainly there were concerns about uh, pedestrian safety on Broadway and, and I heard from Ms. Firth that, that the roadway can uh, accommodate the traffic. I'm sure that's true. But uh, I just want to say I stand ready in any way necessary to work with uh, the developers and, uh, and with the project to, uh, to do what we need to do, make sure it's safe crossing there at uh, Odelia and Broadway. So, um, but otherwise, yeah, uh, I think we moved to do pass, uh, did I? Okay, so we do have a motion in a second. I, I urge your support for this wonderful project. Excuse me. Thank Councilor Harris. Do we need a floor sub? Have you done it? No, okay. So there's a motion and second for 069. All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed, no. Motion passes. Congratulations. Yes. So we will now move on to Actually, we were going to do 054 rank choice voting, but it's the pleasure of the council if they want to take a dinner break. Dinner break first? Okay. You want to do public comment first? Yeah. We'll do public comment first. So, Madam President, um, and also on the propositions, I believe that the city clerk uh, has an event with her family to go to, so we can also look at those propositions because they are going to be deferred. Beforehand? Oh yes, actually I did have it in my notes. Um, why don't we do those first and then we'll move on to ranked choice voting and then we'll have a late dinner. So which ones are those? There is uh, 14 final actions, uh, item A, O-67 is one of them, that's the first one. I can just go down. Okay, there. yeah, A, B, well, let me just get it in order, A, B and C. Yeah, okay. So we'll move on on final actions to 067, Councilor Sanchez, and if you can take them one at a time, R165 and R166. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, this is 067, that is amending Article 6, Section 4, and Article 16, Section 3, 6, 7, 12, and 20 of the Charter, amending Chapter 2, Article 4, Part 13, ROA 1994, the filing of petition ordinances, 
and amending Chapter 2, Article 4, ROA 1994, to add the limitations on the seed money and maintenance of campaigns and off-year ordinances. I move a deferral until the August 5th meeting. There's a motion and a second for deferral until August 5th. All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed, no. Motion passes. Thank you, Madam President. This is R-165. That is adopting propositions to be submitted to the voters at the next local election to be held in the city of Albuquerque concerning questions amending Article 21, Sections 2 and 3, Article 4, Sections 4, Article 5, Sections 2, Article 8, Sections 14, and Article 16, Sections 3, 4, 8, 12, 15, 20, and 21 of the Albuquerque City Charter and adding Sections 22 to Article 16 of Charter providing the form of the question and the designation clause for such questions on the ballot. I'm, I move deferral until August the 5th. I think we're going to move the amendment first. Okay, that would be amendment number one to R-19-165. And it reads on page 8, line 10, after the term voter, insert the following and encourage more of city residents to participate in local elections by allowing them to direct funds already budgeted and available to candidates they support. There's a motion, there's a motion and a second for floor amendment number one. All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed, no. Motion passes. Back on the bill as amended. I move deferral until August 5th. Second. As amended. There's a motion and a second for a deferral until August 5th. All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed, no. Motion passes. Councilor. Thank you, Madam President. This is R-66. That is concerning the local election to be held in the city of Albuquerque on November the 5th, 2019. I move deferral until August the 5th. Second. There's a motion and a second for deferral until August 5th. All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed, no. Motion passes. So now we are actually on... Is that, is that the last one? Is there any, there's, no. So we're back on um, 01954, and I think we'll start off with the public comment on that. I, I think we need a motion before we get started, right? So is there a motion? Thank you, Councilor right. Davis. There's a motion second. Madam President. Councilor Jones? Uh, we're not going to do public comment at all tonight. We were originally yep. talked about doing public comment and then moving to this as the agenda states. What? Okay. So we have public comment for 054. That is not public comment. Not general public comment will be after this. After this and before the next vote or? Yeah. Well. You're going to do them. To, I don't understand. I wasn't going to do them together. I was going to just do the public comment under the 054. So this is not public comment, correct? This is comment specific to, to this 054. item. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah. So first speaker is Gerald um, Kiyutu, followed by Candace Bauer, Brower, followed by um, Ray Allen Smith. I applaud your stamina. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, President Pena, and good evening, counselors. My name is Jerry Kutu, and I reside in District 4. I'm here this evening to dispel a few common misconceptions concerning ranked choice voting for Albuquerque. One, the proposed RCV amendment to the Municipal Elections Ordinance, sponsored by counselors Benton, Davis, and Winter, did not originate with them. The councillors were approached by groups of their constituents, including myself for District 4, who strongly believe ranked choice voting offers distinct advantages for our elections. Two, RCV would not be a dramatic change to our present runoff system, as some have claimed. Its instant runoff feature simply compresses the runoff process into a single election, saving many hundreds of thousands of dollars and avoiding other negative aspects of the runoffs. RCV is a small change compared to the switch to our runoff system, which was approved by voters in 2013. Three, RCV has not been shown to benefit any party or incumbents any more or less than a top two runoff or plurality voting system. It just benefits the voters. And finally, four, 
Ranked choice voting is not complicated. We all use it regularly in our daily lives, from picking out ice cream at the store, to renting an apartment, to buying a car. As the next speaker will tell you, in her experience introducing RCV to people from the age of five to 85, it is easily grasped with less than a minute of explanation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Our next speaker, Candace Brower. Good evening, Madam President and City Councilors. My name is Candace Brower, and I'm also a resident of District 4. And for the past few days, I and a small group of RCV advocates have spent time at the public libraries educating Albuquerque voters about ranked choice voting. Since so many people we had talked to had never heard of it before. Not only did we explain how it works, we gave folks a chance to vote for their favorite flavor of lifesaver using a ballot like the one you see here. Hopefully you will see it. <laughs> there you go. There you can see that's what it looks like. So there are your five flavors, cherry, orange, pineapple, raspberry, and watermelon. Since we had heard concerns that seniors might have a hard time understanding RCV, we asked folks to indicate their age on the ballot as well. In all, we collected 91 ballots from folks between the ages of 5 and 85. And what we learned from doing this is that not only are voters of all ages able to figure it out, but most of them like it a lot. Because we were curious, as to which flavor would win, we decided to go through the actual process of counting the votes. Since the highest ranked flavor, cherry, got only 33% in the first round, we went through three more rounds to declare cherry the majority winner, with watermelon a close second. And here is what it looks like. For those of you that are as curious as we were, there, there it is, there are the three. And it did, notice, it did take all four rounds <laughs> to get to a winner. So, um, given that most of the folks that completed the ballots were enthusiastic about RCV, once they tried it for themselves, we are hoping the city council will put RCV in place by ordinance this fall, rather than making us wait till 2021. Thank you. Hello, Council, uh, City Council. This is my first time testifying, so thank you. My name is Ray Ellen Smith. I am in Councilwoman Borrego's office, uh, district. Um, and I just want to tell one quick story about ranked choice voting. My son works at one of the tech companies here in Albuquerque, and um, he did ranked choice voting with the 200 or so people in his tech com company to figure out what kind of beer to put in the keg at the, at the tech company. So ranked choice voting is um, abounding all over town. So I know we're all, we're all in favor of fairer elections, fewer negative ads, ensuring better voter turnout, less need for money in politics, but money is what I want to talk about. And from what I understand, we could either spend somewhere between $290,000 on a runoff election, or we could spend a million dollars, or the option I like best is nothing. And I think that we should go with ranked choice voting, save our county and our city some money, in addition to reaping many other benefits. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speakers are Roger Kenlet, Maureen Scowran. Katia Adams. Good evening, Madam President and Counselors. Uh, my name is Roger Kennett, and I'm a resident of District 7. So first of all, I'd like to thank Counselor Gibson for her support on this issue. Um, I'm here to urge you to support O1954, uh, amending the Municipal Elections Ordinance to implement ranked choice voting by ordinance, and to reject P193, that would send the question of ranked choice voting before the voters this fall and uh, require an amendment of the city charter. <clears throat> now, I'm not a lawyer, but, uh, and you have the city attorney and other legal staff to assist you and advise you, but a plain reading of the charter shows me that instituting RCV 
by ordinance would not violate the charter. And I quote from section seven of article two of the charter, those persons who are candidates for mayor or counselor and receive the largest number of votes cast for the office in question are elected provided the number of votes equals or exceeds 50% of the total number of votes cast for the office. Under an RCV election process, that 50% would be achieved without having to proceed to a runoff election. Further, uh, this is kind of an oddball, but some other folks have pointed out that RCV actually works. But there have been some commentary about that suggests the RCV process somehow taints the one person, one vote fund foundation of our elections. So by example, if we consider a state slate of three candidates under the current system and a citizen votes for a candidate with the lowest number of votes, that candidate is eliminated from a runoff election under the current system. The citizen would then have to select another candidate to support in the runoff election and vote a second time anyway. Under an RCV process, that citizen can place another candidate as his or her well, second choice during the election. That would be a more efficient process and achieve the same result. Thank, Thank you. you. My name is Maureen Scourin. So first off, um, I'm here to support you enacting this by ordinance, ranked choice voting, but I'd like you to get an idea of the support in the audience behind you. So if I'd like the audience, if you support the council enacting ranked choice voting by ordinance to raise your hand. Thank okay. you. And I'd like to say that doing this by ordinance just moves ahead, it doesn't take anything away from the voters if you were to put it to the voters. It just gives them an opportunity to do it ahead of time. It just gives the voters more choice, more voice. If you had a runoff of just the first two people and I favor number three, then my choice is lost. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Katya Adams. I live in District 6. Um, I am here in strong support of implementing ranked choice vote, voting by ordinance. I don't want to repeat what has been said. What I would like to say is that I attended the city council meeting uh, back in May when uh, we were, or you were discussing the um, ban on um, um, single-use plastics. And what I unfortunately found is that uh, the vote of the city council, and I'm, I'm not talking about passing the ban, on um, just the plastic bags, but it was, it, it was mainly gutted, um, which I was disappointed to find out. And I felt like the vote of the city council, or more like the gutting um, of um, all the provisions on the ban did not reflect uh, the wishes and the concerns of the residents who were present here. So my connection is that I hope with all the people here today to support uh, implementing ranked choice voting by ordinance, I hope that the vote of the city council actually reflects the support um, that you see in the audience for this issue. Thank you. The next three speakers are Nathan Joy, um, please no plus, um, Steve Capitas and um, Steve Epstein. Good evening, Madam President and uh, Councilors. I'm Nathan Joy, um, and I'm a resident of District 7. Uh, I'm here tonight to speak in support of ranked choice voting, uh, Ordinance 54. And I do believe that ranked choice voting is more accurately represents the will of the people. Um, it prevents perverse outcomes like vote splitting. Um, and we'll save the city more money by avoiding runoff elections. Uh, Albuquerque, I deeply believe that Albuquerque should show leadership in adopting election laws that more that lead to more representative outcomes. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Madam President, Councilors. My name is Steve Caviedes. I'm a resident of District Two. Um, so I, I'm in agreement with uh, most of what was said from supporters. Uh, one thing that's already been shown in the city of Santa Fe is that during campaign season, the amount of negative campaigning that goes on in campaigns drastically is reduced under a ranked choice voting system because um, you can then just run for 
telling people why you're the second best if they tell you they like someone else first best, as opposed to being confrontational or even worse as supporters and stuff of getting involved in very terrible negative scenarios. Um, this is healthy for democracy. That way we're not treating each other like mortal enemies, but just having different opinions on the, uh, on the floor of politics. The other thing I want to point out is 25 years ago, myself and another band of Green Party members had as part of their platform IRV, instant runoff voting. That's a quarter of a century ago in 94, we were asking, and we had talked with some city councilors about instant runoff voting at that time. This is not a new idea. This is, it's been around for a long time. It's been implemented in this, in this country for at least 25 years. And in fact, it was first implemented in Australia on December 14th, 1918, and that is a stable democracy. It's been running under ranked choice voting for over 100 years. Not voting for this is akin to you not voting for new uh, ordinances on these horseless carriages things that have shown up. <laughs> so, I mean, that's how ridiculous it is that we're not doing this. People have figured out better ways of doing democracy. Let's honor that. Let's honor for those of you who pride themselves on fiscal responsibility, vote for this. It's a no-brainer. It's fiscally responsible. And by the way, there's no system created that does not, that, does, that takes away the inherited advantages that incumbents have. Ranked choice voting won't do that. You're all safe. Please vote yes. Steve Epstein, Eric C. Matamoto. Uh, Madam uh, President, uh, Councilors, I'm uh, Steve Epstein, I'm a registered uh, Democrat, and I'm not representing any uh, uh, political organizations. And I want to express my opposition to ranked choice voting. Uh, first, it, it is rather confusing, and, um, and, he, and our city elections have, have uh, historically have had a low voter turnout. And we need to encourage uh, more voter participation and this uh, ranked choice voting may prove to be uh, daunting and a disincentive. <laughs> Second, uh, ranked choice voting would be at more risk to tabulation errors and possibly fraud. And this could uh, re result in costly recounts. And finally, um, in the event of a runoff election, it would be worth it for the sake of our democracy. Thank you. Thank you. Eric? Hi, Eric Shimamoto. Um, just want to comment that on average, cities that implement ranked choice voting have an increase in turnout of 10% over cities that have not implemented ranked choice voting. It encourages voting. It doesn't depress turnout. And we have state-of-the-art election machines here in Albuquerque that are very good at counting. Um, I, uh, I understand from the Secretary of State's office that that's not a problem. And it wasn't a problem in Santa Fe when they used ranked choice voting in the last election for their mayor. But I'm here mostly to ask you to vote for Ordinance 1954 because a vote against the ordinance is simply a vote to spend a million dollars that we don't have on something that we don't need. We don't need to spend a million dollars to reopen polling places in the middle of the holiday season to ask voters to make a second trip to the polls to vote for their second choice candidate when we could do the same thing on November 5th. Ranked choice just ask voters, hey, in case your candidate doesn't make it to the runoff, who's your second choice or your third choice? And that simple question saves us a million dollars. And we don't have that million dollars. There's less than 300,000 in the budget for a runoff election right now, so a we'll vote against Oh, 1954 is a vote to take over $700,000 away from some other priority of the city. You're voting to spend that money in order to do something that we could accomplish just as well on November 5th. So I urge you to vote yes on Oh, 1954. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Please, no applause. Those are part of the rules. Rich Reiner, Weiner, William Orr, followed by Barbara Villa.
Good evening, Madam President, uh, counselors. Uh, my name is Rich Wiener. And uh, in the many years since uh, ranked choice voting was called instant runoff voting, uh, it has. It has increased turnout. It, it, of all, and of all the reasons to support ranked choice voting, one stands out in my mind, and that is I've always been concerned about the concept of vote splitting. If there are a number of candidates who, who have similar views to mine and there's a couple of extreme candidates, then those extreme candidates can come out on top just because of the numbers and they can end up in the runoff. And, and, and that gets avoided by ranked choice voting. I vote for my first choice candidate, even if it, it, that person doesn't have any chance, I get to vote my conscience and not worry about what the overall, I don't have to worry about the polls or what, what the overall situation is gonna be. Uh, I just, uh, uh, but I have a second and third and fourth choice votes in case my first uh, uh, choice vote candidate gets eliminated uh, in the early balloting. Uh, but I'd like to go on to the question of ordinance uh, versus, uh, versus ballot measure. Uh, first of all, ba a ballot measure is going to cost some money. Uh, just, just for the city, just alone, uh, not to mention the fact that the runoff is going to cost, as, as we've heard, anywhere from 300000 to a million dollars. Be good to save that money. Uh, the, the one, one of the uh, things that I'm most concerned about is now with the November 5th election that we have for the main, the general election, the runoff's gonna be held in, in December during the holidays. And there's gonna be much lower turnout during that period of time. That's not healthy for our democracy. I would like to avoid the expense of the runoff, the expense and, and, and the likelihood of misinformation being disseminated by big moneyed interest in the, in the ballot measure. Let's get ranked choice voting for this fall. We can only do that by ordinance. Thank you very much. Thank you, William Orr. Uh, good evening, Madam President and other counselors. Thank you for letting me speak. I'm William Orr, I'm a resident of District 4. Um, there's been some, I am in support of our, our ranked choice voting. Um, there has been some concern um, expressed about whether RCV should be put to the voters, similar to the decision which was put to the voters about going to a majority vote. Um, I, I, I view ranked choice voting as well within the council's prerogative and purview, um, as does in fact the state law. Um, the voters said they wanted the ranked choice voting to be decided by a majority. Ranked choice voting to me is just a process of how you get there that just as if a runoff is a process. It is something that the council should decide and not to the voters. If you start going to the voters for all processes which come up for, the, for this government, then in fact you lose your authority as a council. We elect you to be our representatives as part of a representative government. And, and to say, oh no, we can't do this. Voting is important, but the voters decided and told you already that they wanted a majority. This is just another way to get the majority vote. Consequently, I, um, I think this is what we elect you to do. And as an, another side, some people might consider me an older resident. I want to let you know I have no problem with understanding ranked choice voting. Thank you for your time. Barbara Villa. Hello. Madam President and counselors, my name is Barbara Villa. I'm a resident of District 2, and I'm here to express my concern for the vote to alter the dynamics of our voting process. We were never given the opportunity to vote as to whether or not we wanted or needed the ART. We were never given the opportunity to vote if we wanted to see changes to our zoning codes, the IDO. You keep passing us by. Now you want to change how our vote is counted. Single vote, how tough is it? Requires no explanation, no interpretation. I urge this council to allow us to determine how our vote is counted. Thank you. Thank you. Lauren Sh Shore, followed by Athena Christodulo, Christodulo, followed by David Metzler. <coughs> Good evening, Madam President and members of the council. My name is Lauren Sohair and I'm a member of the State Board for Common Cause New Mexico. 
Um, I just turned 19 years old and I know a lot of young people that live in Albuquerque. I'm also an Albuquerque resident. And a lot of us support ranked choice voting and this is why you should also support ranked choice voting. There are really three main reasons. Number one, we want to see a popular candidate in office and we want to make that decision once. We don't want to show up to a runoff election. We are young people, we're presented with a lot of choices. That's because we've had the luxury to live in a generation where we get a lot of choices. Which college to attend, how about how many foods there are for breakfast to eat. We already have a ton of choices and we hate trying to figure out our decision. As much as we struggle to figure out a decision once, we don't want to have to do it a second time. We want to have the chance to put all of our choices onto one ballot one time for one election. That's why ranked choice voting is a great option. Another reason why ranked choice voting is a wonderful option to young people is because we want to see candidates seek out not just their first choice candidate, but also being okay with being the second choice candidate. Seek out a broader base of supporters. And we want to see that. Young people want to see candidates reach out to us, not just their constant voter populace, but also the new voters. Also come to our doorstep, ask us about our opinions. We want to be heard as well. And these are the three, two or three main reasons why rank, you should support ranked choice voting. Thank you very much. Councillor Jones, excuse me. Thank you, ma'am. This isn't going to be a question, just oh, okay. a statement. I find it interesting that you want to have choices. You don't want to have choices. You want to do this, and yet you are. And it's, you don't want to go out and choose this or this or this, and yet you want a list of choices for ranked choice voting. Isn't that a little contradictory, what you just said? on how to do this. I, I don't need an answer. I just wanted to state I thought it was, maybe I wasn't listening or paying attention. But if you can't make a decision, I'm sorry, that's rather rude to make those noises. We don't make noises at you. Sorry. I just want to, I just find it interesting that you think one thing is complicated to vote for one person, but you don't find it's too complicated to do to vote for five people and arrange what order you want them in. But thank you anyway. I just. Thank you, Athena. No, thank you. Crystal Dulu. Thank you, President Pena, City Council members. My name's Athena Crista Dulu. You got it right. Uh -huh. And I just want to say ditto to the young lady beforehand. We do want to be able to rank those choices, and and this RCV will make it so that we do it once, because by having a runoff, you're making it us do it twice, basically. You're making us come back and pick our second person. So I'm a candidate in District 4, Brad, uh, Councillor Winter's district, and I want to be good friends with all of the candidates. So I think RCV presents that opportunity. We have the Olympics coming here. We have the Senior Olympics here, and that is the spirit of peace and Friendly competition. RCV allows that friendly competition to continue. So I am in full support of having it happen November 1st, 5th, sorry, 5th, <laughs> which happens to be my birthday. So let's make it a nice birthday present. Thank you. David Metzler, followed by Mal Malona Palmer, followed by Kathleen Wood. Good evening, President Benya and the council. My name is David Metzler, and I'm a, a resident of District 7, that's Gibson's district. I think RCV is simply the most effective and efficient, uh, especially monetarily, uh, way to implement the will of the people. As numerous people have pointed out already, it is a time-tested procedure. It is not an innovation. It's not newfangled. It's been effective in places around this country and around the world. Uh, I do think it really promotes the um, the democratic ideal of electing the, uh, the person who's really the majority winner. Uh, and I think it's entirely in your purview to implement this by ordinance. I urge you to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Malona? Malona. I'm not sure. OK, I couldn't tell whether Sorry. it was an R or an N. And it looks like an R or it's an R. Uh, so my name is Laura Palmer. Thank you, Madam President and City Council members. I live in District 6. I want to thank uh, Councilman uh, Davis for sponsoring this. And I just would like to forward what everyone else has said prior to me, that passing the RCV as an ordinance not only will save us, our taxpayers, money for a possible runoff elections, but also any cost that can be attained when you're putting into ballot majors for putting forth for a public vote. Thank you for considering this ordinance. Thank you. Kathleen Wood, followed by Sandy Stolberg, followed by um, Maria Perez, 
followed by Juan Avila. Good evening, Madam President and Councillors. I'm here representing um, District 8. I mean, I'm in District 8. But I'm, I'm new in the area as well. I am an entrepreneur myself, a software engineer and a website developer. And I'm a new taxpayer for you all. And um, I just am here. I, I read about this bill online, and I, I believe it is interfering with my representation because it is going to create a new majority. You know, I mean, um, basically, um, whoever does get the one individual vote is still a majority. And if the people are not happy with that, yeah, I, I believe it's a burden on the people to have more, have to have more research and know we're not picking a team, we're picking an individual and an individual's beliefs to represent us. Um, also, I think um, it's clear that it was, you know, um, you and um, you were elected by a majority. You, uh, the laws that you are voting on here tonight are elected by, are, are put through by a majority, simple majority vote. Yeah. And I do appreciate your service. I see how much is going on here. And I know it must be a lot of work and effort on your part. But I just do want to appeal um, that, um, um, you know, um, to let us continue to use a simple majority in our things. And I think there's a missing, uh, coming from upstate New York and coming here, um, really, I think it's worth 100000 to have a new election. But I think there's an, an idea that you could quelch the whole need for this by just going to a simple majority in the vote to begin with and not requiring over 50%. I'm not familiar with that. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker, Sandy. Hi, good evening. Thank you so much um, for allowing us to speak on this issue. Um, I am in complete support of uh, the RVC by ordinance. Um, I think that it gives every person a voice the first time around. Um, and we all know that we need to have robust voter participation in order to make our democracy healthy. Um, I want to, everything that's been said here tonight, I support. Uh, I've got a little bit different view on it though, in terms of um, we know that we need to have the voter participation and we also know that the second time around on the runoff that we have a dramatic plummet in the amount of participation. So in essence that almost becomes, this system becomes a way of suppressing people's votes the second time around. And that's a concern for me. It's like, you know, my kids were able to understand, do you want to have Hop on Pop to be read to you first? Do you want Stella Luna or do you want Goodnight Moon? And at the age of two or three, they understood that. And I think that the voters here are smart enough to understand that going forward. So thank you again for your time. Thank you. Maria Perez, Juan Avila. Good evening, Madam President and members of the council. My name is Maria Perez. I'm with Common Cause New Mexico. And I obviously am here in support of uh, ranked choice voting. I agree with everything the advocates have said pretty much. What I wanted to touch on today is this uh, concern about whether there's enough time to educate the voters on this. Um, I um, led the effort in, um, in Santa Fe in partnership with the city to get that voter education campaign going. Uh, we had about eight weeks to do it and we got it done in Santa Fe uh, in a very successful way. Uh, you know, 65% of the voters in Santa Fe marked all five rankings on their mayoral ballot, which shows me that people really got it, right? People got into the concept of ranking their candidates. And we did see a 10% voter turnout um, increase. Um, I just got back from Las Cruces this last weekend where I led a um, training how uh, for campaigns and candidates and their teams on how to think about ranked choice voting, how to campaign with the ranked choice voting system. And we had 52 people attending that training. And it was a whole day training. People were really enthusiastic. We had people from all political spectrums and opponents working together on, um, on scenarios that we gave them uh, on, on a fictitious campaign that they were supposed to be working on. So immediately we see with ranked choice voting that friendliness, that uh, spirit of cooperation that comes up uh, between the campaigns where you're not mortal enemies, but you're just people with different opinions um, trying to, to get a vote. So I encourage you please to support this uh, bill by ordinance 
and thank you very much. Thank you. Madam President. Councillor Davis. If I could ask Ms. Perez a quick follow-up, if that's okay. Sure. Uh, Ms. Perez, you mentioned, while you're coming back, you mentioned that you had run uh, campaigns to educate voters in two other New Mexico cities. Can you tell us about what the cost of those campaigns were, say, in Santa Fe, for example? Uh, I know a lot of earned media worked there, but there was some organizing in the community and about how to do that. Correct. So the, the way that we did it in Santa Fe is that um, I worked with the city with, uh, at that point, uh, the PIO, who was Matt Ross, who is now working here in Albuquerque. We met, we decided how we were going to do this and what the city was best positioned to do and what the coalition of community partners that I was leading was best positioned to do. The city was going to sort of take the 30,000 feet approach. They were going to uh, develop a branding, which I'm sure you've all seen with the little bears and the lizard and whatnot, um, and, and develop some materials that then the community partners were going to use so that voters got a consistent message. The city also agreed on running some radio ads and some uh, newspaper ads. And what we agreed to do as a community partners was to do more of the one-on-one -on -one and small group touches to the voters. So. We, uh, we ran a canvas, a door knocking canvas, where 17,000 doors were knocked on. Uh, we uh, did a small grant also with another organization that does leadership development uh, for in, in underserved communities. And they reached out to their networks. That was also very successful. We ran uh, bus, bus ads, right? We wrapped some of the city buses on the main fairways with the sample ballot, with a mock ballot. That was also very successful. And overall, I mean, in Santa Fe, we did it for about $70,000 uh, and, and uh, in addition to whatever the city spent. Thank you, Madam President and Ms. Perez, if I could just, just verify. So at about $70,000 in the city of Santa Fe with some public help uh, to supplement that with additional work uh, by comps in terms of city size and media market size, really, uh, it's about twice that from Santa Fe to Albuquerque in terms of media market. So say $150,000 public education campaign, for example, would be a lot cheaper than say a million dollar runoff. Is that fair? I would agree with that assessment. Thanks. Yes, sir. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Councillor Benton, followed by Councillor um, Borrego. Ms. Ms. Bettis, I had a question. Um, thanks. You might want to hang on. Just, yes, sir. Uh, so, uh, could you tell us about uh, what the data shows as far as, uh, you know, this discussion that, that this would somehow benefit an incumbent more than in a regular runoff? So there's, uh, there's this misconception that, that ranked choice voting benefits, you know, some people say it benefits the incumbent, some people says it benefits uh, the, the new up and coming candidate. What the data actually shows, and um, this data has been looked at particularly in the Bay Area because they've had several rounds, several election cycles, is that it doesn't benefit anybody, right? The, the numbers, I think it's 93% of incumbents have the advantage because of name recognition, and they had that advantage at that percentage rate before ranked choice voting was implemented and after ranked choice voting was implemented. So that has not changed. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Pettis. Um, so, I'm sorry. Um, so, I, I grew up in Española in Santa Fe, so I, I know a lot about the community. And I've worked in Albuquerque for a long time, 30-some years. Um, the populations are somewhat different. And um, I just wonder, did you guys do an ed like when you educated the public, um, on ranked choice voting in Santa Fe, was there a Spanish um, education involved in that? In, yes, and thank you so book? much for the question. Absolutely, all the materials uh, developed by the city and then uh, that we also developed with the city's branding were done bilingually. Um, and we ran um, train the trainer workshops so that we, when we trained people who were going to be engaged in get out the vote work, uh, like the legal women voters, like you know the indivisible groups, or different different sort of like civic groups, um, we did those trainings in Spanish and in English, and we provided those uh, Spanish and English materials. Another point that I'd like to make about voter education is that really the candidates and their campaigns were our best partners. They did at least 50% of the education because those campaigns are canvassing and they're knocking on thousands of doors anyway. So it really behooves the campaigns and the candidates to make sure that the, 
voters understand the system. So this is why the, those candidate and campaign trainings are done early on so that those uh, folks who are working for the campaigns have the right messaging that has been tested on how to talk to people about this. The most effective thing is just to show them a mock ballot and um, having those, that partnership with the campaigns was invaluable. And just more importantly, how many different languages did you do the voter education in? In Santa Fe, just in curious. Santa Fe, we just did Spanish and English. Just Spanish, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Travila. Hello, Madam President, Council. Thank you for hearing me. Um, I'm here in support of O1954. Of course, uh, it's something that, as you've heard from many of us, we want we wanted to go into play as soon as possible. Um, I want to start off by saying I, I really, I really wish that the government cared as much as they do about teaching us how to navigate range choice voting. I hope they, I wish they cared enough, and put the same amount of care into teaching me how to do my taxes and take care of my financial um, responsibilities when I graduated high school. I mean, ranking someone, who, my preference of vote seems a lot easier than getting my taxes done and. Frankly, I find a little offense that we're so worried about how we're going to teach the community about this. I mean, it really is, is, I mean, whether it is in Spanish or in English, it's as easy as uno, dos, tres. I mean, really easy. I mean, the whole idea, I got to, I got to speak to um, a class of new citizens with uh, an organization that I volunteer with. I mean, they, they know enough English to be able to name who the president during World War II is. I mean, so. Uh, you could imagine, uh, they frankly, all the, the English they know extends to, the, to the, the range of the citizenship test. But I went over ranked choice voting with them, and it was something they were excited about. It was something that they were happy to be involved in, um, and something that they, they saw huge, uh, huge benefit to. And I, and I encourage all of you to continue to do your research and look at the benefit that this is not only bringing our democracy, but also our economy within Albuquerque. We are a fast growing city and our city continues to grow. Just in, since I've been born, this, this city's gone over close to 200,000 people and we have to realize that a new voting system needs to be placed to be able to accommodate all our necessities within the city. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Ab thank you Mr. Avila. Um, Nic Nicholas Bevins, Jesse Crawford, followed by um, Louis Jenka. You can make your way to the front and. Hello, my name is Nicholas Bevins and I'm a resident of District 9. There's nothing I can say that hasn't already been said. And I'd just like to urge my uh, representative, Councillor Don Harris, to, uh, support, uh, to support ranked choice voting. Thank you. Thank you. Jesse Crawford. Madam President, members of the council, my name is Jesse Crawford. I'm a resident just down the street here in District 2. And I'm here to express my strong support for ranked choice voting. A strong democracy requires the willingness to evaluate and improve the way that we make the voice of the people heard. And ranked choice voting is an approachable and simple method uh, that not only saves time and money, but also improves our democracy by allowing voters to support minor party and independent candidates without the fear that they're throwing their votes away. In fact, it's so simple that I think it's a bit uncharitable to think that uh, our voters, including our honored seniors, might not be able to choose both a first choice and a second favorite choice. In fact, ranked choice voting is very much like the system we use today, except for it uses uh, smart technology that we already have available to perform the runoff immediately instead of going to the hassle of uh, a second trip to the polling place, not to mention the expense of keeping the polling place open a, a second time. Finally, I'd like to address the fact that uh, there are two similar but critically different proposals on your agenda today. Uh, I say, why wait to make this a smarter city uh, right here and now instead of uh, waiting another two years? I'd like to urge your support for 059. I think it's an excellent, or sorry, 054. I think it's an outstanding opportunity for the city of Albuquerque. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Louis Jenka, followed by David Tenorio. Uh, hello, uh, Madam President and uh, Councillors. Thank you for uh, letting me speak. My name is Louis Jenka, and I live just down the street by Wells Park. Um, I guess I'll keep it short because I think people here pretty much covered it all. But uh, um, runoff elections are sort of a huge pain. Uh, sp speaking as a young person, it is difficult enough to find the time to go ahead and uh, make it to the first election, uh, to then go ahead and find the time to make it to a second election uh, when we could just be doing ranked choice voting and uh, saving everyone that trouble seems pretty silly. So uh, I'm here to go ahead and uh, speak in strong support of passing 054. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Madam President, Councillors. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak my mind on this issue. My name is David Tenorio, and I'm a constituent of District 5. So uh, a lot of points that have been made I already agree with, and I don't want to waste your time repeating them. I know you're probably very hungry. Thank you for uh, allowing for this comment to happen before your dinner. But I will say that currently our, we have a two-party system in so many of our elections in America, and it's fundamentally broken, right? So the two-party system means that a lot of the times people have to settle. People have to choose for the lesser of two evils when they vote. It's tiresome, it suppresses voter morale, and it's extremely discouraging to when I have to, get, to talk to my friends, who are often young people of color, and I say, no, you have to vote. And they say, well, what's the point? I just have to vote for the lesser of two evils. But with a ranked choice voting system in place, you can rank candidates. People can run for office without worrying about being the spoiler candidate. People can vote for their favorite candidate without worrying that it might end up with the candidate that they sure don't want to win, winning or ending up in the runoff election. You've already heard about the inconvenience that a runoff election causes in terms of getting the vote out. And if we're all true believers in democracy here, then I hope that we will enact changes to making that democracy better as soon as we can, rather than having to wait for an ordinance that would do so much good for the vote and for encouraging a healthier, democracy. I also just want to point out that our voting systems are already equipped to handle ranked choice voting. It's just a simple configuration change. Thank you for your time, and I hope that you'll vote accordingly. Thank you, Steve Pylon, followed by Charles um, Powell, followed by Karen bon Bonmine. Uh, hello, Madam President and members of the City Council. Uh, my name is Steve Pallon. I'm a resident of District 2. And I uh, am here to urge you to adopt by ordinance ranked choice voting. Um, I was extremely excited to find out that you were even considering this. And I think this is a, a big breakthrough for Albuquerque. Um, I would just like to uh, reiterate uh, what the previous speaker was mentioning, that this eliminates uh, the fear of uh, being uh, uh, voting for a spoiler, uh, you get to pick a, your favorite candidate without fear of um, uh, indirectly electing your least favorite candidate. So I think that is the, the most important element of ranked choice voting. Um, secondly, uh, and uh, I would like to make the point that people in the, the country of Malta, uh, Northern Ireland, Ireland, uh, New Zealand and Australia are all smart enough to figure out ranked choice voting. And I think uh, people here in Albuquerque are just as smart as those people. And uh, uh, finally, I'm sure we're smarter than the uh, Motion Pictures Academy uh, that, cho that chooses the Academy Awards. Uh, they use ranked choice voting as well. Thank you very much. And, and please Thank adopt you. it uh, by ordinance. Thank you. Thank you. Charles? Good evening, Ms. President and Counselors. <clears throat> I'm Charles Powell, District 9. Um, I have family in St. Paul. I have friends in Minneapolis, and they love ranked choice voting. Uh, with so many candidates running in city elections, uh, it, we're almost certain to have runoffs. and. Um, to have the traditional regular type runoff uh, is so expensive. Ranked choice voting uh, saves money, saves time, and it increases the, the voter participation in runoffs. 
So this is the way that I strongly um, uh, support, and I hope that you will um, uh, uh, support the measure that puts it into effect other than uh, delaying it for, um, um, for a ballot uh, measure. I think the, that time is very important, and the sooner the better. Thank you. Thank you. Karen Bonheim? Followed by um, David Bearshield. Good evening, counselors and president. Thank you for letting me speak. My name is Karen Bonim, <laughs> and I live in District 6. And I've been excited about ranked choice voting since my best friend from college, who I've been friends with for 50 years, um, told me about it. And she told me how, as a substitute teacher, which she was while she was getting her teaching license, she could explain it to high school students, and it was no sweat. They loved it. Uh, the state of Maine has gone so far as to elect their congressional representatives by ranked choice voting. And I don't think of Maine as a radical place. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't think this should really be too scary for anybody. Um, there are three things that do scare me, though, that are plaguing our electoral system. One is voter apathy. Two is the influence of big money. And three is the negative campaigning, that the having only two choices really brings out the, I don't know, <laughs> the, the, the meanness in some candidates, not all. Um, whereas ranked choice voting brings out civility, which I think we need a lot more of in our democracy. And that might take care of the voter apathy too. And finally, um, you know, if it doesn't work, it can always be fixed. You know, it can always go back to the old way. So why not just be a little bold and courageous and let's give it a shot, okay? Please do support O54. Thank you. Thank you. David Bearshield. Hello. Madam President and the rest of the council, how are you tonight? And I know you're hungry, but you know, I came and wanted to speak on this issue. Um, and I believe that everything has a process. And I believe everything has timing. And everything also should be done in a manner where not only our constituents should be vitally um, educated, but also that I must take into consideration that I, I, I want to support this in, in the best way possible. But at the same time, I want to make a, a clear clarification is that I wouldn't have a problem with it if there were not, we were not in an election season. And I believe that the sponsors of this particular bill should understand the demand of that. Because you guys have done such great things, and I have been great support of all of it. But one of the things that I really would say is that, you know, there's a time for this to be introduced. There's a time for this to be properly educated. I heard about language barriers. There are Native Americans that live in this community that are voters. And we've got to look at many areas of this so that we can make sure that this city is not just like Santa Fe. This city is just not like Maine in certain areas of that. And as much as I want to look at this and support Isaac and, and Patrick and, of course, Winters on this, as much as I want to, I believe the process has to be done in a certain time frame. And it has to be done in such a way, because I support everything that's been said. But we've got to understand the time frame. If you guys did, weren't running for election, I think that, and we weren't in an election season, I then would understand and support it. But I cannot because I'm a candidate in, in District 2 as well. And in, even if I wasn't, I would have to understand that as well. 
and, and, I, and I appreciate everything that you've done, but there's timing. That's what I want to make clear tonight. Thank you. So we have a couple more speakers. And Mr. Bearshill, just for the record, just if you could refer to them as counselor when oh, you're yeah, on the dais. Okay, right. thank you. Um, EM, no, yeah, Ward. Yeah. M. <laughs> followed by uh, Leila Celine, followed by Joel Gaffney. Madam President, counselors, I'm a bit surprised to be in a position to make the following a statement. I agree with Councillor Harris. Um, so my comments <laughs> particularly <laughs> pertain to O54 and P193. So one concern I have is uh, changing the, elec the election process by councillor vote by council vote without approval of the voters at large. My recollection is that when we went from plurality with 40% to 50% runoff, that was by popular vote. And I think the same should apply. Uh, another major concern I have is basically what the previous speaker just talked about. Uh, we have tonight councilors voting to change the rules of an election in which they are candidates. That just does not sit right. So for at the very least for this vote tonight on 01954, I believe it um, prudent and appropriate and ethical that Councilors Benton and Davis recuse themselves from this vote. Winner gets a pass because he's not running. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Thank you, M. Alayla Celine. Good evening, Madam President and Counselors. I'm Layla Salem, and I'm back to plead with you to implement ranked choice voting by ordinance for this upcoming election. Um, I want to just respond to that really quickly and say that um, uh, Counselor Davis is up for election, but this would not impact him because he only has one person running against him. Um, so I'm a District 2 voter uh, and resident, and with such a large number of candidates collecting signatures to run in my district, I want to see the candidate with the broadest support winning. Compressing the election to one day is the most respectful and efficient use of voters' time and, if, and taxpayer money. Votes in other cities, states, and countries with RCV are overwhelmingly happy with this type of ballot, so let's do it too. Thanks. Thank you. Joel? Good evening, Councilor, Council President Pena and Council. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to give this public comment tonight on such a critical issue. I am reading this statement on behalf of Robert Blancara Nelson, City Council candidate for District 2. Robert sends his apologies as he is traveling on business tonight, and he wanted to make sure to, that he gave comment tonight for this important issue in our local election. Robert's campaign is in support of ranked choice voting and considers this new method beneficial not only to up-and-coming candidates, but for the people of Albuquerque as a whole. Ranked choice gives people a chance to vote their preference, thus never wasting their vote on a winner-take-all system nor on a split vote. It also saves the public from expensive runoff elections with lower voter turnout. Ranked choice creates an, the instant runoff until a majority of votes is achieved. Uh, Robert urges the council to vote in favor of ranked choice voting for the good of the people. Um, separately, speaking for myself, implementing ranked choice voting immediately rather than sending it to a ballot initiative, would allow the city to review the system and evaluate its effectiveness of its implementation this cycle, when there's only four city council ra uh, races up, as opposed to putting it for the first time before the voters in 2021, when there are five city council di districts and the mayoral race at, at stake. I think it's important to, if we're gonna do this, we need to do it now so that we can try it out and make sure that it works. Thank you. Thank you. Cheryl Harris is the final speaker on 054. President Pena and counselors, it's a pleasure to be here tonight. I've spoken to the council many times, and a lot of them were sad times when we were dealing with some of the police shootings and things, and there was a lot of sadness in the room. Tonight, I cannot believe 
the difference in attitude in the city and the joy and the things we've talked about with the Senior Olympics and everything else, it is just great. It feels good. Um, so I'm here in favor of ranked choice voting uh, being implemented tonight by um, a, a vote of the council. The main reason is that it will save money. Uh, money is just so valuable in this budget where you just went over a billion dollars and we can save that runoff election a month later. Um, the, the, you have a fiduciary responsibility to do the sensible thing and the sensible thing is ranked choice voting. Uh, the second election uh, in the season of the holidays is gonna create a drop off in people. Uh, I'm in District 5, by the way, and um, we don't have any elections in 1, 3, and 5, so we're going to be putting up voting locations in 1, 3, and 5 that people are just going to be driving by most of the time, and they're going to do nothing because our runoff elections will be more than likely in District 2 and District 4. Um, the solution of training, I believe it's, it's a simple thing to understand. Other people have said that, how many places it's used, and it will not be that difficult to, for people to understand it. The idea of picking your first, second, and third choice in a very positive way just makes a lot of sense, and we've all been doing it all of our lives. I want to thank you for the opportunity tonight. Thank you. Thank you. We'll be taking a break now, so um, we will be back in about a half an hour. <laughs>